I'm gonna die on a toilet, aren't I? Guys like you don't die on toilets. Well, that's nice. Greetings, friends. Welcome back to Critically Acclaimed, the podcast where highbrow and lowbrow collide. Boom! Boo yeah! Boom shakalaka! Boom it's, goes that dynamite! Do you remember when the Fox animation block was uh, promoted with the catchphrase, It's the Boom? <sighs> Vaguely, yeah, like it wasn't. It's the bomb. They said it's the boom. Oh right! I think that was for like half a month in 1999 or something. Remember that time Kevin James was a mixed martial arts fighter in a movie to pay for his high school music class that he I don't even think he taught. Yeah, well, the, his high school needed funds, and yeah. to raise money somehow, he got into a ring and fought a lot. Yeah, and and, and in that particular instance, there mm-hmm. went the boom. So they called it. Here comes the boom because that's more of an immediate, you know, present tense, mm. exciting. I would rather just watch the Liz Taylor film "Boom" with mm. an exclamation point, or that Greg Araki mm. film "Kaboom." Kaboom. Was that Greg Araki? That was Greg Araki. Yes. Yeah. It was Greg Araki. Like he, he made a few like really showed that he could make some like mature movies. Mm. He did stuff like Mysterious Skin, and uh, he was trying to move beyond his uh, really colorful, porn inspired. Uh, nihil- like teen nihilism movies like The Doom Generation. And then John Waters came up to him at a film festival and said, hey, when are you going to make an old-fashioned Greg Araki film again? He's like, okay, fine, I'll make Kaboom. Mm-hmm. And Kaboom's not that good. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome back to the Greg Araki podcast, where we mostly talk about Greg Araki. And, and films that have the word boom in the title, evidently. Yeah. Uh, my name is Whitney Seibold. I'm a film critic for the internet in general. Uh, I'm a, I will write reviews for you if you'll pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my name is William Bibiani. I am also a film critic for the internet. Mm. And uh, everybody calls me Bibbs. And it's the last uh, critically acclaimed of the month. And in the last critically acclaimed of every month, we review an entire franchise of films that have been mm. selected by our Facebook fans on the Schmoville Facebook page. All owned by you, the people. Yeah, so this is all your fault. <laughs> if, this, if this isn't a fun podcast to listen to, it's on you. Um, no, it's on us. No, it's, it's, it's our job to make it fun. Yeah. And we'll, we're, we'll make it as fun as we can. Uh, although you chose for us the Lethal Weapon movies. Mm-hmm. So we'll be reviewing all four of those. Yeah, we're not going to talk about the TV series, sorry. Mm-hmm. But uh, we will talk about the four enormously successful mm-hmm. Lethal Weapon movies. Uh, we're also going to be reviewing a couple of new releases, including The Maze Runner, The Death Cure, mm-hmm. Kickboxer, Retaliation, and Love and the Saucers. Mm, saucers. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the Oscars. The Oscar nominations uh, were earlier mm. this week. Uh, Whitney and I have a long-standing uh, tradition in which we wake up, watch them live. Oh. Uh, we go over to his apartment, and uh, we eat fancy donuts, and at, we at, kvetch. At, at, yeah, 5, 5.30 in the morning and whinge about what didn't get nominated. <sighs> uh, even though we openly acknowledge that the Oscars are not any sort of real gauge as to what quality is, our favorite movies rarely are the ones nominated for best picture although lately lately it's like, actually been la- pretty good last year was pretty good because you know moonlight won best picture and that was my number one well d- darn it that was one of the best movies of the year I, honestly the um, last several years they've nominated mm-hmm. my number one uh moonlight it was mm-hmm. nominated this year get out was nominated that was my number one last year uh, i think the year before that was mad max fury road uh, that was your number one yeah I th- yeah uh, oh, whiplash right. i think was my number one uh zero dark 30 was my number mm-hmm. one uh and those all got nominated so right. uh, and only the one so won, but like still yeah. it was pretty good actually i'm, I'm pretty come, lucky lately come awards season though uh people like you and i who uh pay attention to like awards shows and actually we're on a nominating committee this year uh, uh for one of the critics for one, awards, one of the critics the oscars, awards yeah. not the oscars we're, we're not members of the academy yeah Yet. <laughs> as, <laughs> Ever. As soon as we get that short made, um, I don't know what it'll be about, but we'll make it short, damn it. Because it's easier than a feature, I assume. Oh. I, I'm sure there are plenty of shorts makers out there saying, you bastard, it's just as hard. <laughs> um, but a, a certain group of films start to emerge pretty early in the process as to what, like, are the critical darlings that year. And there's usually about 10, and now that you can have one to ten uh, Best Picture nominees at the Oscars, none of these were really kind of a surprise. It's all the the yeah. usual suspects that have been cropping up in all of the awards shows, uh, which is kind of uh, 
kind of disheartening because when you see the patterns start to form, you know early on that some of your favorites aren't going to be nominated. Well, it's interesting. They they it's been almost ten years now since they did it, but mm. you know they uh, they changed the nominations process so that there weren't five Best Picture nominees. Mm. Originally, there were ten, and then there were up to ten based on uh, what got the most preferential votes. Because Best Picture, unlike the other Oscar uh, categories, you don't just vote for the film you want to win, you rank them. Mm. And so that way, uh, the film that wins is the one that most people agree on. If it's divisive, it doesn't win. If everyone agrees on it, boom. Uh, And the idea with that was that it would hopefully free up the field to have different kinds of films Mm. nominated. And sometimes that's the case. Specifically... Batman. Uh, <laughs> Batman the, and Wally. Batman and Wally. Yeah. Uh, the reason that they expanded the categories, there was a huge uproar in 2008 when uh, The Dark Knight was not nominated for Best Picture. And, and a lot neither of, was Wally. And neither was Wally. And a lot of uh, people were sort of up in arms saying, you know, t- films like The Dark Knight never get nominated. So the Academy said, you know what? We're going to have 10 nominees. And the next year, lo and behold, they had stuff like District 9. And, and um, Avatar. Uh, yeah, Avatar. Big, like, audience-pleasing blockbusters mm-hmm. in addition to the usual... Uh, Suspects of Oscar, biopics, Oscar ba- and, biopics yeah, and you weepies know, and yeah, big big Hollywood esque dramas. Many of them great films. Uh, ma- many of them great. Some of them not so great. <laughs> Most of them kind of forgettable. I mean, I don't, I don't, no. I don't give a damn about the artist. Do you? When was the last time you heard anyone talk about the theory of everything or the yeah. imitation game or or incredibly loud and incredibly close or whatever uh, that one was even extremely called? Loud and extremely incredibly loud and incredibly close. Nobody yeah, gave gone. a damn about that movie. No, even at the time. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, why is that nominated for Best Picture? Know, Nobody cares. Something had to be nominated. Look at the, look for the Darkest Hour to be that thing. Yeah, and then they started doing up to nine, and this year was uh, particularly grievous because they did nine Best Pictures, even though they could have up to ten. Mm-hmm. And Wonder Woman, which was a big audience hit and even a critical darling, yep. uh, was, was shut out. Nobody, no nominations. No, for no anything. nominations for anything. I I just put on no. Twitter that this was the thing that kind of bothered me that not Wonder Woman didn't get nominated for literally anything. Now mm-hmm. I realize. Best Picture, Director, even Actress, probably long shot. Superhero mm. movies, with the exception of Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, and now Logan, which mm. got a, a nomination for Death Screenplay. For screenplay. Uh, and The Incredibles was, it, was an original, got an original screenplay nomination a mm. long time ago, but they don't tend to break into uh, the big uh, yeah. awards. And so I figured that was a long shot. But you know what else was good in Wonder Woman? The costumes, the production yeah, design, was, the well, sound. Like, it's weird that it got completely left out of that process, yeah, considering if, it was a pop culture phenomenon. And before you say, mm, oh, it's all about what's the best movie, mm, it's not. The Oscars don't actually worry so much about... the best movie. Well, yeah. every once in a while they do, and that's why when we're really proud of it. Like, mm. oh, man, they actually won for the Cuckoo's Nest one. Isn't that one of the best movies ever? Well, yeah. But mostly what they tend to do is they tend to pick films that will look good for posterity. They pick the films they, they, that make the industry look good. They essentially play the long game. They, mm-hmm. They're going. To, they're putting this on a list that they know include things like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest mm-hmm. and Ben-Hur. And they, they, they're trying to make the industry look good. Yeah. And, and you know, so, a lot of the films that have won Best Picture lately mm-hmm. are films that are actually kind of about the industry and about how great it is. You look at something like Birdman, which is about how all of like the big blockbustery type actors and filmmakers are actually mm-hmm. beautiful artists at heart, or The Artist, which is a love letter to the dawn of cinema, or even Argo, which is about how Hollywood saved lives. <laughs> like the the Not just Hollywood, but producers trapping a movie in production hell were actually playing a game to save people's lives. Yeah. So, it's kind of self-serving. I can see why, pe- why producers might want to vote for Those that. Those movies but. are all various mm. degrees of good, don't get me wrong, but that's we're playing off of the Academy's taste. Mm. Wonder Woman, had it been nominated, at least would have been kind of a victory would have been sort of like hey not only superhero movies getting a lot of respect Mm -hmm. but also a film that was inspirational to an entire generation uh entire generation of women in particular the first Mm -hmm. proper successful female superhero movie that got it right because it's not the first female superhero movie but it's but besides tank girl it's it's like the only one that feels good yeah and tank tank girl is a a cult film at best i'd say it's it's good it's good but it's a weird it's a weird ass but like you look at all the other attempts supergirl is a mess catwoman is a mess Mm. electra is like a functional luke basson (laughs) two and a half star action movie at best who even really cares about electra i revisited it recently and i I gotta tell you it's aged better than i thought 
thought. Like, it's, okay. just, it's just a competent action movie. Mm. It's really just not, it's just unremarkable. But, like, yeah, it, Wonder Woman did something fantastic. It broke women out into mm. uh, the blockbuster uh, mold. Um, yeah, I, it would have it would have been great press. It's it's odd that I, the Academy didn't go with I it, whether the, or not you think it's your favorite movie. I think Justice League might have done it in. Now, Justice League was a hit, mm. but it wasn't a huge hit. Oh, and, and, it, was, and it was critically drubbed, and, and everyone yeah, knew about all the messes behind the scenes. Yeah, you, and you and I are thinking some of the only critics who thought, hey, that was okay. No, yeah, it's a mess, but it was I entertaining. I, I don't hate Justice League. It but, worked on its own yeah. merits, yeah. But yeah, I think because Wonder Woman is part of this series, it was kind of dragged down by the back films around but it. Suicide Squad came out and that got nominated and won for best makeup yeah, that's true that's but a little it, odd so, below uh, the line. I just thought that was weird but you know what I'm super happy about I'm super happy hmm. that not one but two basically horror movies hmm. are leading the pack get okay. out hang on the shape of water is a only, monster only movie. now being called a horror movie. I think it's a. I always thought it was a horror movie. It's a horror hybrid. It's, it's a. It's it a has. Ro- it has a monster in it. It's yeah. a. It's a fairy tale romance. It is not a horror it's movie. It's about but, the and creature he's, from the there's black There's no Lagoon. horror in that. It he eats, eats a cat. I know. It's That's, horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but if we think there about needs it, needs to if be more about, horror. Hang on. Horror if you movie. think about a lot of because it's more like the old timey horror movies. It's more like the old Universal horror movies. Those aren't super duper scary. And in fact, a lot of them, the monsters are the oppressed party. That's the shape of water again. Mm. It's, uh, the the creature from the Black Lagoon in the shape of water is treated far more like the Frankenstein monster and like Bride of Frankenstein. He's the oppressed one, yeah. and the human beings are the monsters. I still think it's it's if you put it in the horror section on Netflix, I don't think anyone would raise an eyebrow. No. Uh, I think it's fine. Right. I think it's a hybrid, mm-hmm. but I do think it's noteworthy that a film about a uh, a person who falls in love with a fish monster. Mm is an Oscar frontrunner. It has the most <laughs> nominations. That's 13 nominations. That's a lot. That's, that's, not that's a li- little only... odd that this is the one, but all right. I just think that's interesting. I'm and surprised I think that Get Out is, is a straight-up yeah. horror movie, and it's a fantastic horror movie, and I'm glad it got nominated, too. I'm kind of surprised that Dunkirk isn't the frontrunner in all of this, because that is the most like traditionally Oscar-y. That one and Darkest Hour yeah. are, are the kind of the big Oscar well, and type the, movies. And The Post, but it only got two nominations. Yeah. I'm a little surprised. The Post is a really good movie. I thought it would do a little better. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know why The Post didn't get more traction, frankly. Mm, I um, think it's, the other things are just more exciting. It, it's quite people. good, and it's you know really timely. I've seen uh, think pieces that call it the first... Uh, like sort of big Hollywood movie that is a direct response to this presidency yeah. and about the way media is being wielded to take down politicians. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's incredibly relevant. And I Very think uh, Spielberg plays his hand incredibly well. And uh, yeah, I'm really surprised. I guess there was, it's just sort of a crowded category. It's a, you know, it's a busy year. In fact, all but, the, uh, in fact uh, with the exception mm. of maybe like I wasn't the hugest fan of Call Me by Your Name, but I totally get it. Mm. Uh, with the exception of maybe three billboards, I think all of the nominees for Best Picture, mm. I guess three billboards and Darkest Hour, which I think is more of like a competent propaganda piece, yeah, uh, with a great performance in it. Uh, I, I guess they're all kind of deserve to be there. I don't hate any of the nominees. Mm. I think it's interesting that three billboards was being positioned as the front runner, and then it didn't get a Best Director nomination, which mm. mostly sinks it. Like there's only been like a handful of films throughout all of Oscar history that, that one that, best one best picture without a director without nomination. a director nomination. And the last time it happened was Ben Affleck for Argo, but when it happened for that, everyone was up in arms. Mm. No one's really up in arms about this. Yeah. No one's like, oh my god, they got so screwed when we have to, nom- to vote for Argo for Best Picture. Mm. No one's really saying Martin McDonough got screwed because he also got a, a screenplay nomination. Mm. And he might be a front runner. The sc- okay, there's two categories this year mm. that are incredibly dense. That are just f- filled with amazing work. And mm. one of them is Best Original Screenplay. No, well, I was, was going to say actress, but well, yeah. I, that was the other one. Yeah. I think I think those two categories, there's, there's mm. like, I think Three it's, Billboards is full of screenwriting cheap tricks. And I'm actually, if like, if the post had made it on there instead, mm. it would have been way happier. But like, you look at like the the four other nominees for best original screenplay: The Big Sick, mm. which I'm shocked didn't get best picture nomination; The Big Sick, Get Out, Lady Bird, Shape of Water, fantastic screenplays, mm-hmm. truly fantastic screenplays. Mm. And uh, uh, best actress is, Sh- is Shape of Water. I think the sc- I don't know. Shape of Water. I think is good, but not great. I, <laughs> I'm, I think it's definitely overrated. Um, I'm never going to call it a bad film. I actually like it a lot. It's a but, great movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's great movie, that it's getting like such a head of steam makes makes you think that this is one of the great you know pieces That's of the cinema thing, know, of the, the I year. Don't hear too many people talking about it as super passionately as like, people talk I, about I know, Lady Bird or Get Out or the Big yeah. I, I know few critics who actually put it on their top ten. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, now it's like the front runner. And so yeah. the, sc- the screen that it's up for screenplay is a little bit baffling to me. Mm-hmm. When you have stuff like Get Out and The Big Sick that are actually based mm-hmm. on like real character and great ideas, and, and Lady Bird, which isn't high and la- concept, yeah, Lady Bird too. Very, very yeah. well and then Best Actress is just an insane mm-hmm. category, and great people were left off of that category. Yeah, like but we got Sally Hawkins for Shape of Water, mm-hmm. which I know neither of us like put that I think on our top ten, but that's a great performance. Yeah, for Frances sure. McDormand in Three Billboards. Mm-hmm. Again, I have problems with the screenplay, but she, she's she, great. She is the one who's bringing that film to life for goodness yes. sake. So, you got yeah. Margot Robbie and I, Tanya. Also fantastic fa- performance. really, really great. Saoirse Ronan and mm-hmm. Lady Bird. Incredible, mm-hmm. incredible work. And Meryl Streep, who, you know, normally when she's nominated for like Florence Foster Jenkins, mm-hmm. there's this idea that just like, well, we I couldn't get, put anyone else there. We, like, we have to get Meryl Streep Does she need, a, does she need another nomination for Florence Foster Jenkins? I mean, she's really good in that movie, but mm-hmm. like, do we need this one? This is one of her best performances. Well, in the post. there's one particular shot that, that <laughs> sort of locked it for her. Yeah. That kind of made the movie in a lot of ways. Sure. But I think she's doing some really subtle, uh-huh. uh, uh, really fascinating work in that film. And I'm really, really yeah, yeah. Uh, happy she's nominated for that particular film. Uh, who would you have chosen who wasn't nominated? Not to kick somebody off, but what was like a great performance you wanted to see nominated? Oh, Jesus. Like, I mean, the- best actress. Because I got one right at the front of my mind. Well, what's, what's, was, your, what's yours? I was campaigning for uh, really hard for Florence Pugh, the actress who was the who played the lead role in Lady Macbeth, ah. uh, a little British indie that is so great. And it was on my top ten, and nobody paid any attention to. Uh-huh. Uh, where yeah, you know, she plays this sort of ven- vengeful spirit of feminist vengeance <laughs> in a really oppressive male run. Uh, era and it's it's just it's such a good it feels like you know classic lit yeah with a with a middle finger in it i'm not sure if it's eligible but carla gugino in oh and uh, gerald's gerald's game, game. Yeah, she, she, great performance. um another uh um, yeah, i'm not sure what the eligibility was that was there but sometimes yeah, she definitely deserved i think some netflix films are eligible and some are not i'm not mm. sure what how the rules mm. really work there uh, i think vicky creeps in yeah and uh, phantom thread phantom Thread. leslie manville got into the best supporting actress and i'm really glad good, and good but i thought vicky creeps mm. gave just as impressive uh, a performance i think vicky creeps and leslie manville are really great and i think daniel day lewis is just sort of on autopilot i don't for think that that's one. his best performance yeah. I mean, it's a good performance but like mm-hmm. he's he's the irony of the performance is that it seems like he's the domineering one and he's actually not mm-hmm. and it's good it's a good performance uh, yeah. i'm not gonna there's there's Fan- phantom thread is up for best picture okay yeah I, I, <laughs> it's i'm a little surprised i, I, I was a little off-putting I actually somehow wasn't knocked over by phantom thread i think it's like pt anderson light he's I, not really reaching deep i think in he's this got one. a high concept i think it works but i think it's kind of a gimmicky movie once you like see where it's all leading to yeah. and it's a good movie it's, i just i'm a little it, surprised it did that well it's a setup for a joke with a single punchline i'm really yeah. happy denzel washington got nominated me for too roman J. as well did you finally see it i i yeah i saw it early on Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I reviewed. Oh, I reviewed it. Oh, did we review it again? I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, I thought that's a great performance. It's it, it's a one of the better characters he's played. Yeah. Um, he's really reaching deep. It's a really complex, really interesting character. I think because the screenplay does a disservice to the character, mm-hmm. uh, the film itself hasn't been getting a lot of acclaim. But that's mm-hmm. no fault of. Of no. Denzel Washington. Well, that's the thing is we're looking at pieces here. Yeah, you know, it's the, this piece of the movie is great, and in mm-hmm. fact, there's a lot of nominees in the acting categories who are not nominated, who are not in films nominated for Best Picture. Case in point, uh, Christopher Plummer, mm-hmm. nominated for All the Money in the World, which is a great one, one of the films I haven't seen on the yeah, nominees list, which is just a great fuck you to Kevin Spacey. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just it's like hey, he did it in a couple of days and he got out And you know what? The movie is a mess. I think there's two things I really love about it. I think Michelle Williams is great in it. Mm-hmm. I think Christopher Plummer is great in it. I honestly think I would not be surprised if he won. The Christopher Plummer. I would not be surprised if he won. I know there's there's a lot of people who want to vote for Sam Rockwell, and he is still the front runner along mm. with Willem Dafoe. It would not surprise me if Christopher Plummer just snuck in there I'll as a little up. as a little a little fuck you. I'll actually be upset if it's not Willem Dafoe because he's so damn good in the Florida Project. Oh, he's just a great actor yeah. overall. So fair enough. Um, I'm trying and, to and, and you know it's his due. He doesn't have yeah. an Oscar yet. And mm-hmm. again, we're talking about posterity. We're talking about the way the Oscars like to think and. We should probably give an Oscar to you know the, the notable stars of the generation, and well, I know we should Willem wait for the, the right moment. We I know Willem Dafoe. Def- well, but. not necessarily Gladiator, but uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that's and, and that's one of those apologies. The, 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 the Gladiator Training Day crisscross that there's happened this, those yeah. two years in a row. Well, there's this thing I don't know if you're list, people listening or, or where this, but there's like this sort of weird tradition in the Oscars. If you look at it, where like a great actor gives one of their best performances ever, mm. doesn't get an Oscar for it, but they get an Oscar the next year for whatever for, they got for, for a good performance, but not nearly as good as the last one. Mm. So like Russell Crowe probably should have won an Oscar for The Insider, mm. and instead he got an Oscar for Gladiator the next year 
Lear, which is a good performance, but nowhere near a great performance. No. Or uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Oh. Uh, the venerable James Stewart. He was nominated for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, one of the greatest screen roles ever. <laughs> didn't get... What, didn't, what, a, what of the greatest of all American films, I would yeah, argue? In one of, nominated in one of the toughest years in Academy history. Look 39, it up. 39, yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> Look up 39. 39 <laughs> is one of the most amazing years in film history. Holy shit. Mm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Lost... Mm-hmm. Won the next year for the Philadelphia Story, which I would actually argue he's like a supporting. He's actor. a supporting actor in like, that one. The, yeah, but yeah, he got best actor. He lost to uh, I think it was Robert Rodot in thirty nine for uh, g- Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Did he really? Which is you know again that's a great performance. Yeah. You've seen Mr. Chips, right? Uh, sure. Yeah, about, so, yeah, about a you know a man who just the life of a teacher and he grows old and he's you know has romances and it's actually a very sweet, very winsome film. Um, so I'm not going to necessarily fault that he won. It's just. In in the in the eye of history, Mister Smith goes to Washington. Man, come did, on! Did you say Robert Rodat or Robert Donat? I, I said Rodat. Yeah, Rodat is a, is I think was a, a writer. I think oh, okay. wrote, like, Don, Robert, Donat. Right. Sorry. Donat. Yeah, yeah, Robert Donat. Sorry, yeah, little, so that's brain, one of the things that threw me off there, a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's mm-hmm. the thing. Oh, Jeremy Irons didn't even get nominated for Dead Ringers, one of the great performances. Playing two, two of roles, them. yeah, two roles in that one. <laughs> played, a, played identical twins in that, and then I, he that's for, too weird a movie. Though. Too weird a movie, but everyone knew he was amazing in it, and then he got nominated and won for Reversal of Fortune. Which is also a fantastic performance. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> like if he had won twice his, in a row, I would have been fine with that. His his his, his performance as Klaus von Bülow is is one for the books. Reversal That's of so Fortune good. is a movie that is absolutely brilliant in every conceivable way, and people do not talk about it ever. Anymore. Talk about it's Reversal so of weird how that movie is just like people are like is that a film? Yes, it's a film. It's brilliant. Uh, See Reversal of Fortune. Oh, it's about the Klaus von Bülow case, where he he was accused of poisoning his wife and uh, may, maybe accidentally over medicating her, but maybe not. And yeah. it's about the lawyer who has to defend him in court. And, and whether, we're never really sure what his motivation was or what he actually did. My God, the last scene. <laughs> the last scene is so where so, so he, don't don't ruin it. He tells a joke to a pharmacist, and it's great. <laughs> it's so fucking great. Uh, mm. Anything else noteworthy about the Academy Awards before we move on? I'm trying to think oh. if there's uh, um, just you know, a lot of my my unpopular favorites rarely get nominated. Yeah. Why is Valerian not up for Best Special Effects? That's ridiculous. That, if you're, if you're it, look, at, I know it tanked. I know it was a bomb. I know and, nobody and liked it. I know it killed the studio. And you know what? Look if at you, the special effects you, in a bubble. If you don't say. like the story, fuck it. The visual effects are so much better mm. than like, what else was nominated. I think Guardi- than- Guardians Two, Star Wars, um, Planet of the Apes. Uh, uh, Kong, Skull Island, and, Ka- and Blade Runner. Kong like, and those Blade are all Runner. great visual effects. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but I can think of at least two or three of those I would have totally knocked off for Valerian. Ka- Kong. I mean, Kong. Yeah, again, good looking movie. I'm, but I'm not going to give any short shrift to the people who worked on that movie. But well, come on, Valerian. <laughs> well, we talk about the idea of a snub. Yeah, and I was having this conversation with someone online, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I was like, "Oh, Wonder Woman and Valerian got snubbed." And I thought that was kind of a bummer. Or and Weird Al got snubbed for Captain Underpants, which pisses me off. And, <laughs> to be uh, fair, not Weird Al's best work. No, but his, great song his, though. It's fun. His, the song he wrote for UHF is like way better. Should have been nominated. I agree. <laughs> but the response I got a lot was, "Well, who should have been like? Who would you knock off?" And I'm mm-hmm. like, "It's not about someone who's nominated being undeserving. It's about there being more than five deserving candidates, mm-hmm. which they're usually." are and so it's a sometimes matter of not, but sometimes yeah. not but they usually are and mm. so it's like i still don't understand why there's only three nominees for best makeup and hairstyling practically every movie has makeup mm. and hairstyling it's ridiculous mm. but like hey, except for bright evidently they have no makeup <laughs> artists <laughs> if you don't get that joke netflix left like the entire makeup crew off of the credits it, in bright it, and it's it, a it, makeup it was it was a, it was a clerical movie. error they didn't do it on purpose but, it's but a huge error. wow what an error but regardless like, like a lot of people lost their jobs for that but regardless you know they, they they're making a choice oh. okay we only get to nominate five we won't nominate Wonder Woman mm. or Valerian. They made a choice not to nominate that one. And you know what? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. But wow. the whole point of the Oscars is that, again, they are for posterity. It's lame when they leave something off that's really great mm. and will be remembered later. Yeah. Valerian may not ever be, like, you know, suddenly reevaluated and considered one of the great classics of cinema, but people are going to look back at it. They're going to look at back at that opening sequence. They're going to look at the visual effects. They're going to look at how innovative the action sequences are. And I think they're going to be influenced by it in the future. Yeah, yeah. Much like Blade Runner was a huge bomb when it came out. <laughs> As was the sequel, it turns and, out. Yeah, yeah, but they're both gorgeous, mm, incredible really productions. technically impressive And I think production. they're going to influence how people make movies in the future. 
So we'll see. <laughs> but my point is, watch Valerian. Damn it, Valerian was so much <laughs> so fun. Good. I loved oh, it. God. I watched it again on video recently, and it gave me the same thrill. It's, it's like, so oh, this neat. Is so, so great to look at. Ah, so cool. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, right. Let's review uh, some of the new movies. Let's review some. Let's uh, review the. I guess the big release is uh, the Death Cure. Yeah, the Maze Runner Three, which uh, I'm guessing is maybe the final kick of a genre that might finally be just sort of out. And that is the adaptation of the YA dystopian fiction novel mm-hmm. genre. Or just YA sci-fi yeah. fantasy. The, the novels about young people mostly mm. saving the world in yeah. some fantastical way. And what I think is interesting is that there are... I just did an article for IGN about this. Mm. There are at least 25 failed attempts to make a blockbuster YA franchise. Yeah, and I think we name-dropped a couple like oh, in, a in, in, in a podcast recently yeah. uh, where you brought up like Cirque du Freak, which I had forgotten about. Cirque du Freak. The, the Seeker, The Dark is Rising. Yeah, Aragon, or, uh, Beautiful Inc- Creatures, which Inc- was actually Inc- really Heart. good. Beautiful Creatures was really good. No, Inc- Heart, it's not. Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> Spiderwick <laughs> Chronicles, a lot of people like that one. I like the Spiderwick Chronicles. Um, Alex Ryder, Stormbreaker. You know, oh, that, that movie made less than $1 million in America. Wow. Yeah. There's a ton there, there, of... There's, there's more than one Agent Cody Banks film. I For know. goodness sake, Alex Ryder couldn't get anything. And it had a good cast, too, but uh, I guess... Alex Storm, Ryder, uh, Chaser, Breaker. Another uh, another Alex Pettifer movie didn't get didn't go anywhere. Uh, I Am Number 4. I saw I Am Number 4. Yeah. I, I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's bad. So, but regardless, yeah, it's just another genre. Mm. I, I don't really... I, I it's, was, it's, I wouldn't call it a genre. I'd call it a trend. Uh, well, I think a, it's a, both. A, tre- a, tre- a trend of very... Like, it's a little too specific. Like, like it's a, it su- is a it's genre. A, I guess it's a subgenre. It's but, certainly uh, a subgenre. Uh, and so many of those failed, and we kind of ran out of the big hits. The big hits were uh, Harry Potter, yep. Hunger Games... Um, Twilight mm-hmm. and uh, what was there's like well, one Maze other. Runner. I, Maze Runner is the only other one mm-hmm. to hit the end of the book franchise. I suppose yeah, like the yeah. Allegiant movies were successful at first, but now and we kind of petered. The out. last one made so little money the that they decided not to make the last one. Mm-hmm. Then they said, "Oh, we're going to do it as a TV series." And all of the big movie stars they got lined up for mm-hmm. the movies like. Well, we're not doing a TV series. We want to just do movies. So they're probably just going to reboot it or something. Yeah. We're still working on it because it still has value. Like the Mortal Instruments, a movie mm. I actually rather enjoy because it's insane. <laughs> um, is, is Shadowhunters now. Yeah, it, they, they canceled the movie franchise and they rebooted it on television. And it's reasonably successful. It's a it's, basic it's, cable fantasy show with a big following. I, I'm following all of those actors on, uh, tw- on Twitter uh, because... And for <laughs> for new listeners, you and I reviewed the entire first season, episode by episode, on the B-Movies podcast mm-hmm. back when it was airing. We thought it was going to be canceled after one season. Yeah, we was, were confident it was going to be canceled It was after the pilot one episode for our podcast, Canceled Too Soon, about mm-hmm. shows that were canceled after one season. Nope, it was successful. It kept on going. Yeah, who And knew? yeah, it's got a lot of followers. Yeah. Crap show. <laughs> it's a, the cast is cute. The like, cast, it's the it's cast a fun like, enough show, but like uh, it's just... Cheesy and uh, silly. Uh, uh, Gene Siskel had a, a really great rule. It's like if if you're going to judge a film by like how entertaining it is, you can perhaps judge it by is it any more entertaining but than watching the same actors just having lunch together. Yeah, and I would love to see a series about that cast of. Uh, mortal Instruments, Shadow Hunters, mm-hmm. just sitting around, like having brunch once a week, talking about their experiences working on the show more than I want to watch that show. Fair enough. Uh, like those, because those are charming young people. They I, wanna, sure I are. just want to watch them converse. I don't yeah. necessarily need to see them acting. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So the Maze Runner is concluding, yeah. um, and I got to tell you something. I actually really enjoyed the first two Maze Runner movies. They you enjoyed have, the first one. I did actually. I All think right. the first two Maze Runner movies are fun action movies. Mm. They don't make a lot of sense. In fact, after three films, the first one makes less sense than ever. Because yeah. the premise was, a whole bunch of kids wake up in the middle of an uh, enormous... Ma- young boys. Yeah. Ma- males, specifically. Yeah. And a, a, a young woman joins them eventually, and it's a big plot point, but a bunch of young boys, teenagers, mm. uh, wake up in the middle of a little glade at the center of a giant labyrinth, like the size mm. of New York City. Like, it's huge. <laughs> And and it's just a labyrinth. There's like, it's not yeah. like a city. It's just big, I'm just, gi- I'm just gigantic to tall scale. walls, and like, there's like skyscraper sized walls, and there's minotaurs in the labyrinth in the form of mechanical spiders with like flesh monster heads. Yeah, it's like, it's like the. It's kind of weird looking. It's there's, like, it's like kind of scary, I guess. It's like one of the creatures from like that movie Nine, but like it, it, it looks like that erector set baby doll head thing yeah, from 
yeah. from Toy Story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a creepy little monster, yeah. and the whole thing is they don't know why they're in there. They all have amnesia, except they can only remember their names, mm. and they're trying to find a way out of the labyrinth that is extremely deadly. And you know what? It's kind of cool. Uh, it's, for, for, it's, a fan, uh, uh, like, for an ep- a bottle episode of like an uh, anthology series, that oh would God. be fine. Like, if this was an episode of Outer Limits, it'd be a classic. Like, yeah. it's just a cool premise. There's a lot of great action. That in they it. tried to turn it into this post apocalypse fantasy oh with God. a really deep mythology with dozens of characters was a mistake. Well, they never explained why they're in the labyrinth. Yeah, the labyrinth doesn't make it. Okay, so it's revealed at the end of the first Maze Runner that. It was part of a test, and if those who could get out passed the test, and they're they, immune to a virus, they're, and they're immune. <laughs> evidently, that immune makes them a immune to a virus. I don't understand I, that at all. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no. The maze has nothing to do with anything. No, it really does. And there's this vast conspiracy to keep kids in this maze by wicked adults uh, headed who actually by, literally but, work for a, for a company called, called Wicked. Wicked W C K D Boston. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have loved to have been at like the the publicity meeting where like we're going to call it Wicked. Why don't we change that? No, we're we're taking it back. You're taking back wicked? What is it? You're taking back evil? I I prefer that mean. I prefer like the ironic evil corporations. Like we're Happy Helper Inc. It's like Happy Helper Inc. is like the the evilest corporation in the world. Everything but shoes. (laughs) (laughs) That's a really big shoe. That's a reference to the movie Freaked, which is another one you should definitely watch. <laughs> That's uh, a funny movie. I love that movie. Uh, <laughs> so the second movie, The Scorch Trials, uh, was introduced this notion that, yeah, there's mazes everywhere, and they're using them to yeah. judge who is immune to all a certain zombie there's virus a, There's a that's zombie been virus sweeping the world. There's a zombie virus I remember very that little about over. it. Hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll, all right. I'll burn you through it real fast. There's a zombie virus... There's a few, like, small colonies of people left. The Earth is basically mm. completely uninhabitable and filled with monsters. But there's these, one, one super high-tech city where all of the rich people still live, and uh, they're, and they're looking for a cure. We don't really know that for certain until the third one, but yeah. And then, like, all of the kids from the first movie and, like, a couple of new ones, uh, they go on the run, and they basically just plow through the desert and like Omega Man torn up cities and there are a bunch of really amazing action sequences and then one, it, and then the one plot gets chase, too complicated and then it ends. There's one chase through a fallen building that I thought was really it's cool. It's really but. like Wes Ball directed all of these movies mm. and I think he's I think if the scripts made any sense he would be really celebrated right now because he really knows how to direct an action sequence. He's really, really great at keeping um, the action clear and dynamically composed. He's really, really great yeah. about putting things in foreground and background at the same time. Like, I want Wes Ball to direct, like, a James Bond movie. Like, that would be a great-looking James I, Bond I think movie. He's, I think his career as a second-unit director is ahead of him, but... Uh, yeah, because he's directing these weird scripts, those great action sequences just come crashing to a halt as soon as there's any kind of exposition. Mm-hmm. Boys, there are a lot of exposition. It's, it's so much exposition, you can't keep it all in your head. Yep. Some people all are done. related to other people. Some people have amnesia and some don't. Some are good and some are evil. We are not really sure what Wicked's up to. It's revealed in this one that they're just sort of – that this walled-off city, now we're in the death cure, mm-hmm. have been looking for a cure for the zombie virus this whole time. Well, we found out, we found that out at the end of the last one, but there was yeah. like deniability. Maybe it was real. And maybe it it's wasn't. revealed in this one that they essentially can extract fear juice out of people's <laughs> brains. Like, it's like in that movie, I Come in Peace. Like, when you're really, really terrified, that's when your brain produces alien drugs. And it that's had when, to be terror sweat. And, yeah, essentially, it has to be fear sweat. <laughs> and they can suck fear sweat out of your brain and make a zombie virus cure. Okay, good. I'm, <laughs> you're fine I, with that? I, I can wrap my mind around that idea. You, you have, like, fear juices in your brain, and you, I, you scare them. And so I find that a bit of a stretch, honestly. They're injecting people with nightmare juice, and they're having fear, <laughs> and they're sucking fear juice out of their brains and making zombies. And, but that doesn't kill them. They just need to scare them a lot. Uh, but, yeah. That's, that's, you know, that sucks, but at least you're getting a cure out of it. And it's it, it's eventually revealed that one of the characters we've known all along like is has something in his blood and that know, just they, they straight up cures the virus. Straight up cures the virus. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And you're watching this and you're revealing, oh, okay, finally they have this cure and we can finally cure the world. Wait a minute. So the wicked, wicked corporation, yeah, knows like they have the resources and they're actually doing good work to cure this virus. And the rebels are trying to blow up the city where the cure for the virus is. 
Yeah. And the, the whole re- thing kind of collapses right the there, ma- doesn't it? The maze has nothing to do with anything. Why were you erasing mm-hmm. people's memories and putting them in a maze? It really has nothing to do with anything. It, ma- it, it makes almost as little sense as the Resident Evil films. Oh, <laughs> shut your mouth! Nothing makes as little sense as the Resident Evil. Films. And the Resident Evil films make like even scene to scene they make no sense. Like each yeah. scene contradicts the previous one. It's really incredible. No, like this one again. I think it's a very entertaining action movie if you can forgive oh. how blame the plot is because I like the young cast. I even like the older. Cast. Giancarlo Esposito's in it. Mm. He's great. Doesn't have enough to do, but he's he's cool. Yeah. Um, like Aiden Gillen and Patricia Clarkson are in it. They're like the fun. Like they're the gets. Yeah. Like, you always get you always get cool actors to play the adults. Like in Beautiful Creatures, you get like Jeremy Irons and Emma Thompson. And you're like, ooh, <laughs> um, Kate Winslet. Yeah. So like. That's cool. I, I totally, I, I'm totally like, I'm just sort of enjoying. Anytime there's action, there's a cool bus chase. There's a great there's train a, heist. It op- it opens with a really great train heist, which is just as good as the train heist from Fast Five. Oh, I would take the Pepsi uh, Challenge. It might even be better. It's really great. It's really, really good. Yeah. And like you said, it's really dynamically filmed. It's clear. I prefer like good. Yeah, I prefer clarity in my action sequences. You should know what's going yeah. on. That's that simple. I don't understand why filmmakers think that part's optional sometimes. Mm. It's like, really weird. Well, I, I think the thinking is that if you put the camera like right down, they're trying to make it more realistic. You put the camera right down in the action and as if the cameraman is down in there running around. The problem with that is that the camera's moving too much. Yeah. You can't see the action. There's dirt and smoke flying everything. Sure, that would be realistic, I suppose, but I'm... It's not a documentary. I don't want the I, hand... Like, I, I think I, Paul I, Greengrass ruined that with, like, Paul, Born Paul Supremacy. Greengra- yeah. I think well, he and made that just when, way when, too di- popular. when digital cameras just sort of started coming into their own and became, you know, viable options for big blo- big uh, budget blockbusters, you could actually hold the camera and run around with it, and that became sort of the the way action scenes had to be filmed. Yeah. Uh, when you had bigger, larger cameras, you couldn't do that. You couldn't run around with a camera. You actually had to frame them. Yeah, you actually... <laughs> And, you know, when we actually started putting the camera in the action, everybody said, wow, how dynamic. And, yeah, that worked for maybe one movie. And then when everybody did it, it just everything sucked for a decade. Yeah. <laughs> All action films it became, became really unclear. So yeah. it's nice that we're getting back to something where things are a bit, a bit more clearly filmed. And, anyway, I digress. My point is mm. the death cure. I think it's the I think it's the worst Maze Runner by far. Um, I, I, I think the, <laughs> the first, first one's the really, first one's the worst. I think no, I think the first one's really fun. I really mm. do. I think it's a fun the ending doesn't make any sense, but before that, it's a really fun, mm. you know, sort of weirdly, I don't know if it's high concept, but you'd have to be high to appreciate this concept. <laughs> Just like this really fun what sci-fi. What a maze, man. Yeah. But it, there's, it's neat. It's a neat flick. I think it's fun. I think yeah. uh, the Scorch Trials, again, once they start explaining shit, it's a huge mess. There are some incredible action sequences in the Scorch Trials, mm. and I think it's a very entertaining flick. This one has entertaining bits, but it has, the thing is, they've got nothing left in the tank. All they have to do is just sort of wrap everything up, and that's when you realize that when your plot makes no sense, and you have to spend basically an entire movie with that plot, your plot sucks. Yeah. <laughs> like, this isn't, but you're right, there's another one where the bad guys, I mean, maybe they're being dicks about it, but they were right. Yeah. They were the trying time. to do the right thing. It's like the, Oliver the, Platt in like 2012 when he's like, oh, Oliver Platt, he's so evil. He's making really hard decisions to save the human race. I sympathize with him. And, and he actually has a speech to that effect. Yeah, like, like, I, I, I'm like not going to save my mom. Uh-huh. I had to make that choice. She's not, you know, I, I, someone who's like, if we had to pick a mm-hmm. very small percentage of the population, my mom doesn't make the cut. Mm-hmm. I did that. I hate that. I feel yeah. terrible about that, but this is about the survival of the human race. I sympathize with that. That's a tough call to make. And I sympathize with Wicked now. I'm like, okay. I still don't understand what the whole like, maze fucking shit was about. I don't <laughs> or, you know, like, there are a bunch of rebels and they're not communicating with, like, all of the, the vagrants that are living outside the city walls. Probably because they're hard at work. But everybody's like, man, they got all of the money and all the power and they're clearly up to no good. So we're going to storm the walls and start bombing crap. It's like, what are you, what are you doing? They're working to save you. Yeah. And, and at the very least, I they're like the last functioning city in the world. You want to get in there and live there. Yeah, you don't want <laughs> like to wreck that city. It's, no, what that's you all doing? you got left. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, There's one well, and I want to plug it. This no. isn't. The, this isn't the best. YA. Like, what, what is the what is the best? What is the best YA franchise? Um, well, I guess if you count Harry Potter in there, I think it's Harry Potter. I'd right? see the second of the Harry Potter movies is the. Best. I'm talking about the whole franchise. Oh, okay. Oh, I guess just as a whole. Yeah, I would uh, say it's Harry Potter, right? Yeah, probably Harry. Harry Potter, Potter maybe Hunger Games. Uh, is, uh, maybe Hunger Games. Yeah, Hunger Games. They stretch it out too thin at the end, but it's still. Cool they, they stretch out too thin from the beginning. Right. That's a simple idea that they. Pat out. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. But this is you know it's 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 better than the Twilight movies. The Twilight movies have their positive qualities. 
it fulfills a certain function. I'll give it yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 there's an enjoyable element to the Twilight movies, and I and I get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maze Runner is just a functional B action franchise. That's really all it is. But it's uh, it should have been if from, it was made from the Canon Group in the '80s, you would love this. But, well, if it was done by the Canon Group in the '80s, it would have had a kind of. Uh, clunky exploitation charm to it. I don't get that because they're aiming at teenagers now. Like mm-hmm. they're clearly making it for people of the age and younger of the characters. Right. And they're trying to stage the uh, like the adult world as this evil corporate a- entity that you have to sort of fight against to gain your independence. But they kind of did and that in the eighties. Wasn't that like Solar Babies had some shit like that, right? I mean, like, s- sort of. But there, there was sort of a, a kind of there's sort of a, a like an uh, an fu punk rock attitude to that that's lacking from stuff from well, a lot fair. of the more uh, modern ones. You're right. I kind of wish that happened on the Maze Runner now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. You, and you look at the Maze Runner, and it does have the same kind of uh, pro-military, pro-violence message that a lot of these mes- these films have. You know, um, where the, the all teen- about young people taking up young arms, people take yeah. up arms and murder adults, and you know that's kind of what a lot of these boil down to. And it's about mm-hmm. joining this very fascistic, militaristic way of thinking. Um, you know, Divergent is worst about it. Hunger Games has it as well, and it's in here too. Yeah, Hunger the Games heroes, at least toys with the complexity of that. Yeah, like the, it, it, that's that, that's conflicting. I mean, it, it ends up being just that's the catharsis. But yeah, there's there is there is at least a little. Conflict when you actually in there. look at how it ends, it's not cathartic at all. It's actually a real yeah, bummer. Yeah. But. Um, but yeah, the, yeah D- Divergent right. celebrates it to the heavens. Yeah, I, I find them, those films really irresponsible. And yeah, here we have these young people who are taking up guns and storming the city because that feels good. Yeah, even when though it doesn't really, actually make sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's not getting you anything. And why the hell are you just suddenly celebrating the fact that you can murder a bunch of people? Yeah. And it, it's offering a, a kind of irresponsible adolescent catharsis that a lot of teens have. Like, I just wish I could set the world on fire sometimes. Yeah. And catering to it in a really unhealthy healthy way it's certainly, so, um, it's certainly unconstructive it, it's it's a, only an underpinning in the maze runner movies but it's still there and i find that to be a little trouble i can appreciate that mm-hmm. okay now i didn't see the other two movies so tell me about okay. kickboxer retaliation Retali- kickboxer colon retaliation or maybe it's just kickboxer retaliation mm. is, it, um, is it a retaliation of kickboxers or is it a kickboxer who retaliates uh, there's no. I, oh I, no! There's, I there's, there's a whole kickboxer retaliation. There's kickboxers everywhere. He They're storming up, the gates. The, the hero ends up doing what the villain asks him to do. So there's not really all that much retaliation. Um, but this is the seventh kickboxer movie, if you can believe it. That's insane. How many have you seen? Uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the first, and now I've seen the seventh. I've never seen um, a kickboxer movie. Really? I think I confused it with Lionheart. What? what were, or what, wasn't that the, what was the one with the Jean Claude Van Damme? Wasn't that Lionheart? That's Kickboxer. Lionheart was Kickboxer. Well, Jean Claude Van Damme is is the star of Kickboxer. I thought he was also in a movie called Lionheart that was similar to Kickboxer mm. that I confused with Kickboxer. Now, kick, Kickboxer and Bloodsport are two that I constantly mix. Yeah, up. Lionheart. That's a different movie. That's exactly the same. Okay, <laughs> it's around the same time. They're all they're all like, like they're all ripoffs of Enter the Dragon anyway. But Blood, uh, like Bloodsport. Kickboxer and uh, Lionheart came out like within like a couple of years of each other. Are they all kind of blend together? Well, like Bloodsport's pretty good because it has Bolo Young and he's a yeah, cool villain, yeah. and, and the and the setup's really straightforward. Yeah, it's fun. And, uh, Kickboxer uh, is about like all these other movies, a uh, kickboxing tournament, like a, an yeah. underground shady kickboxer yeah, tournament. Yeah, Lionheart was also about an underground like and fighting Blo- tournament. Bloodsport so is also, also yeah, about an underground fighting tournament. That's all he had. Um, that's all he had and, in the tank. <laughs> so uh, this is the seventh of the kickboxer films. There were five in the main uh, continuity, mm-hmm. and they shifted protagonists, and then they rebooted it with the, the sixth kickboxer, and they brought Jean-Claude Van Damme back. And, uh, the sixth da- boxer, sixth boxer, and Dave Batista <laughs> was the villain in Sixth Boxer. Oh, that's fine. All you need to know about Sixth Boxer is that uh, the hero who let me look up the, this guy's name because he's actually a really good fighter. Mm. Um, his name is you can do uh, it, Elaine a- a- Moosey. Ah, Elaine Moosey, who was in, he was a stuntman in some uh, superhero films. Yeah, uh, he was the the hero of the last one. He killed Dave Batista at the end of Sixth Boxer. Oh shit. And now in Seventh Boxer, uh, he is he is lured back to Thailand, where the previous shady uh, kickboxing tournaments took place, and he's thrown into not just prison, but kickboxer prison. <laughs> there is a special prison in Thailand where they keep all the evil kickboxers. And and where when he gets there, he has a big, big one take fight with all of the kickboxers, and it's really great. And that sounds who, awesome. And who's in the kickboxer prison? But Mike Tyson. What? <laughs> the no, Mike Tyson. What the really? Who, who this sounds awesome. Kind of playing himself, I guess, because who else can Mike Tyson really play? This sounds amazing. 
amazing. Yeah, and and he's like, oh man, I don't want to be in kickboxer prison. It's like, well, you'll you'll learn to survive. Also, there is uh, a really famous Brazilian soccer star who I'd never heard of named okay. Ronaldo. <laughs> oh, I heard Ronaldo. Yeah, Ronaldo. Yeah, Ronaldo, Miguel, yeah. Ronaldo is also an evil kickboxer in kickboxer prison, oh, and he can okay. and he can kill you with soccer balls. Yes! <laughs> like he kicks soccer balls at you. This sounds like the best movie ever. <laughs> Who should enter the kickboxer prison? <gasps> but Christopher Lambert. Yes! <laughs> oh my god! So you, you're already having Mortal Kombat flashbacks, oh my god. saying I am an evil kickboxer dude, and I have the Mountain from Game of Thrones on my side, Ooh. and you have to fight that guy, and he's nine <laughs> feet tall and weighs eight hundred pounds. It's like, oh well, crap! I don't want to fight that guy. He'll murder me. Well, you have to fight that guy. So Alan Mousset says, "What am I going to do?" And uh, Luckily, Jean-Claude Van Damme, repri- <laughs> reprising his role, comes back and says, I will train you with the help of, <laughs> of oh Mike Tyson and Ronaldo. Yay! So he trains to fight this big dude, and he fights him. And that's the whole movie. <laughs> that sounds like a great movie. It is... Look, all, all you, you don't need much of a story in these. You really don't. You don't. I, this is one of the things that always pissed me off about the Street Fighter movies. Mm. We had, like, two live-action Street Fighter movies, and none of them were about a fighting tournament. Or just street fighting in like, general. One like, was, it's about a military coup. Yeah, like, like the first one they had gave, like a, su- a side. I think it's because like they they actually like looked at the arcade game and they looked at sort of like the backstories of all of the characters and they actually tried to fold a lot of that into. Wait, that's but all, there's like so much military training going on in backstory. the arcade game. It no, doesn't really it's matter. It's all backstory. It doesn't matter. It's just so they tried to the turn it into this big military coup. Fighting and, tournaments uh, are easy. Look at Enter the Dragon. A bunch of cool characters. They have to fight each other. Yeah. Then they have to team up and fight the bad guy. It's easy. We don't need it more complicated than that. In fact, after Enter the Dragon, maybe one of the best of these movies is DOA Dead or Alive, which I maintain is one of the best video game movies. It's certainly one of the most entertaining it's, video game it's, movies. It's just daffy and silly and... Yeah. and exploitation through and through. That is a drive-in movie. Oh, absolutely. Let's get a bunch of, like, hot women in bikinis and have them wail on each other and Eric Roberts is the bad guy. Sold! And it, I'm and, there. And it feels very positive, too. Like, yeah, yeah. Have, it's, and it's actually like having kind of, a fun time in the movie. It's kind of bright and, yeah, yeah. They, they do... I understand the video game series did this as well. They take a, an intermission from the fighting For to have a volleyball yeah. tournament. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have Jamie Presley in it, and she's great, and Holly Valance it's from ex- Taken. It's and, yeah, exactly it's, what it's trying to be, and it does a good job at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and this one's kind of in the same school as DOA Dead or Alive, okay. because it is going to just do the exploitation stuff, and it's going to do it well. What you need in a movie like this is really great fighting. And boy, howdy, does this, does this have great fighting. Yeah. They, they stunt coordinate the hell out of this movie. Yeah. Uh, Alain Moussi is a fantastic stuntman. He's clearly mm-hmm. a really great fighter. They got really fantastic choreographers, and they have a really interesting pairings and in this big fight at the end where he fights this, like, I think the actor is over like seven foot six or something. Yeah, he's, he's just huge. a huge guy. Yeah. Uh, really, and you know, Alan Moussi is like five foot six. He's really tiny it's next like the to movie this arena. guy. Yeah, he's fighting that big dragon monster. Although that big dra- that big dragon puppet is so awkward. It's like <laughs> he can't barely move. Like, I- I'll just. <laughs> Stand here and punch you. You can't move, stupid. Dragon if you haven't puppet. seen, I think it's 1989, 1990. Thereabouts. Yeah, it's this weird. Uh, uh, imagine, like, basically Bloodsport or Rocky. Okay, mm-hmm. take Rocky, but instead of fighting Apollo Creed, he has to fight alien monsters. Uh-huh. It's about a human who joins an intergalactic fighting tournament on a space station that is basically Deep Space Nine to the extent two, that two of the actors from Deep Space Nine are, are in, are in it. it. And one of the actors from Babylon 5. Yeah, Cla- Claudia <laughs> Christian is also in it's really weird. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Ar- Armin like Shimmerman kind of playing a corkish character. I love fighting tournament movies. Actually, mm. here's the thing. I'm not the biggest fan of sports in general, but I love sports movies mm. because the action is very clear and well-defined. And it just gives you, like, this person's going to be competing mm. against this person. You like this person. You don't like this person. Boom. Mm. That's that's it. As long as the, the sporting event, the action, the fight, the baseball, whatever, as long as it looks cool, you got a good movie. Yeah. yeah. Really great. One of my favorite uh, franchises of this is actually Undisputed. <laughs> the, un- the prison fighting movie. Yeah, it's really cool. So like, the first one is about how uh, basically Mike Tyson, but not Mike Tyson, played by Ving Rhames, mm-hmm. is sent to prison. And he is drafted into the underground prison boxing tournament against Wesley Snipes. The problem is, they're both not nice people. None so of them is, you're not really sure who to root for. Yeah, either. you don't know who's going to win. It's Usually it's obvious who's going to win. It's not. Mm-hmm. Either of them could win. They're both equally kind of shit, like as people. But they're both really great fighters, so that's mm-hmm. cool. Second one is stupid, because it's all about how like the Ving Rhames character, is now played by Michael Jai White, if memory serves, 
uh, basically he's forced to do literally the same thing again. But with, but with a new inmate. So, but, with, yeah. but with Scott Atkins playing mm-hmm. Boyka, who is the most complete fighter in Russia. Oh, geez. It's so cheesy. But then the third one, they realized it's all about Boyka. <laughs> and so it's about, he's the main character. Yeah, and now it's all about Boyka entering like an illegal, like to the death fighting tournament. And Undisputed, I actually haven't seen Undisputed 4 yet, and I really need to. I keep meaning mm. to, and I keep not having the opportunity. Undisputed 3 has amazing fight sequences. <laughs> like, genuinely great, mm. amazing fight sequences. Like, uh, Western cinema has not, does not have the best history of how to shoot fight sequences. Yeah, we Undisputed 3 is pretty to, solid. had to rip off Hong Kong pretty much. For yeah, but even then we screw it up. We, yeah. we cut it wrong, or we don't, like, actually get people to know the choreography well mm. enough, so we can't do long takes. Undisputed 3 kicks ass. All right, cool. Like, the, the, so, and, and this one kicks ass too. There's, there, there's too much plot in there. Mm. Well, I, the, the movie's, you gotta pad it out. The movie's somehow. almost two hours, and you know th- this needs to be ninety minutes. There's like yeah, this whole subplot with the guy's like girlfriend who is looking for him, and all of these other back alley dealings with all these other people. It doesn't really matter. All that all that subplot stuff can be cut out. What you want is the fighting tournament. Yeah. What you want is good co- fight choreography and. As a, since those things are so good in this movie, it's actually r- incredibly watchable and actually really enjoyable. Cool. There's one finishing move he does. It's so impressive he does it twice in the final fight. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, you know, in a singing in the rain when Donald O'Connor does like he runs up the wall oh, and does yeah. a backflip. He does that on a guy's chest and kicks him in the face on the oh, way back. Oh, that's he fun. does it twice. <laughs> And that's, that's cool. not a spoiler. I have to describe that because you, now you want to see that. It's a right? selling yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. It's a good thing. Okay, tell me about. Okay, last one. Tell oh. me about uh, Love and Saucers. Right. Uh, this is one I, I reviewed recently for IGN, so I figured I'd talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, why not? Uh, Love and Saucers is a recent uh, uh, documentary film about a guy named David Huggins. He's 72. Uh, he lives in Hoboken, New Jersey. He's kind of just a ordinary, affable, crotchety old guy. Works in a deli, has, you know, ex wife and a few kids. And he uh, has also been a painter his whole life. He's really inspired by, you know, impressionists of, of the 19th century. And the subject of all of his paintings is his alien abduction experience. Ah. Uh, throughout his life, he claims to have been visited by alien greys. Uh, which is something we don't really see in pop culture so much anymore. It kind of fade away. If you're not familiar with what we're talking mm-hmm. about, uh, the popular rendition of a- extraterrestrial life forms as little gray aliens with big eyes and like yeah, small mouths, eyes, yeah. and that's frequently called amongst geek culture gray aliens or gray. the grays. Well, not even geek culture. It was just sort of a fringe thing for a well, while. Well, I'm but, just uh, my point. Well, I think that's relatively geeky by well, today's I, I, standards, I but you know so. what I mean. Like it's but not. It, it was, it's not necessarily common parlance. In in like the mid '80s, when Whitley Stryber and Bud Hopkins came out with their books, uh, which were all about alien abductions, it became sort of this weird sort of f- actual fringe belief that these aliens are coming to this planet and taking us. There's been evidence of UFOs released recently, if you yeah, recall. By the government. By the government. Just saying, we don't know what but, this is. It's alien. But I'm like, uh, what the fuck? How, is, the, how uh, is that not bigger news? The, the fact that a guy from Pizza Hut commercials is president now is so weird that that is like back... Proof back of better extraterrestrial stuff. life is, is not meaningless weird now. So wow, we have proof of extraterrestrial life, and this guy uh, wow. s- says what when he was times. when he was a teenager, he uh, was visited in the woods by this really strange looking woman who said her name was Crescent, and they had a sexual relationship that lasted decades. She would come to him, they'd have sex. Uh, he had all of these uh, visions of aliens, like sort of looking over the. Uh, the uh, proceedings, he would have orgies with these really tall, monstrous women with alien heads, and he painted all of these weird scenarios. He's a big science fiction fan, and you know he collects VHS tapes, and he has, we get to see the interior of his apartment, which looks, which looks a lot like my dorm room, <laughs> just like full of Columbia House videos. And uh, the film is really, really tactful, and it just lets him tell his story and lets him display his art. And it doesn't once present this as something that's freaky or strange or fringy. Mm, let's laugh it doesn't, at this guy. It doesn't imply yeah. for a second that he has anything wrong with him. He's just an ordinary guy, and he had these really strange experiences, which were positive and negative at the same time. You know, he's being taken away. He's, you know, being kind of forced into these sexual relationships. So he, you know, describes it as assault in certain instances, but he also describes this woman, Crescent, as being kind of this warm, loving relationship. So, very strange. Uh, yeah, it's all very strange. And, you know, at some point, in, I've seen other a lot of alien abduction stuff. You know, I was really into this bef- even before The X-Files. I watched that show Sightings, if you remember Sightings. 
yeah. which was like, yeah, the, the unsolved mysteries type. Back when reality and, TV was more like informative documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Than, there were a lot of reenactments yeah. and stuff. And then they finally get it like a professor who studies this sort of thing. And the professor says, you know, I'm not going to say whether or not this is real, but, you know, a lot of people believe this sort of stuff. And this is what it taps into. And mm-hmm. this is actually why this is really important to this guy. And it lets David Huggins have his moment. Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually really refreshing and really brave and very tactful of the filmmakers to never point and laugh and say that this is strange at all. It is strange. But I'm we can re- come up with that conclusion on our own. Yeah, we don't need yeah, the filmmaker and, to, and, to you do know, that. To, to cheapen this guy's life would just be cruel. It's like saying, hey, I was abducted by aliens. Unless you're going to make a documentary about how he knows he's lying or he's trying to pull a fast one. Mm-hmm. Like there's a twist halfway through mm-hmm. where he like changes his story. That never happens. He's got the same story throughout. And he's just allowed to have his story and, most importantly, have his art and how he's sort of working through the strangeness and achieving a good deal of normalcy in his life by painting these really strange paintings of like himself being visited by aliens in this kind of impressionistic style. He's not the best artist, Mm. but that he's so devoted to it makes it really, really great. Mm. And I'm, I'm, did you ever see that documentary film Marwin call? Actually, no. Okay. That, that's another, well, that one's actually about specifically about trauma, but it's another one about how, People who are not necessarily skilled artists are finding art as a means of dealing with something really strange in their brains. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed watching this. It's really, really fascinating. And it was really great to see, you know, all of this a- alien gray stuff kind of being brought back and given legitimacy again, huh. as it was in you know the 1990s. Cool. Mm. Uh, okay. Well, on our uh, critically acclaimed scale of mm. C minus to C plus, with C minus being bad, <laughs> and C plus being as good as we can recommend. Uh-huh. Uh, how does Love and Saucers? Uh, I'm going to give it a high C. It's okay. it's not you know cathartic or anything, but yeah, it's really really fascinating. And what about Kickboxer Retaliation? I can't give it a C plus. It's Why not? not that kind of movie. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't warrant a it's, C plus. It's, it's not as no because it can't it's, be a C plus. C it's movie. not. Like, it's not transcendent. It is. It is never any going to be anything higher than three really shiny stars. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it is is a, the highest possible C. And the Maze Runner, The Death Cure. Oh goodness, C minus. I'm going to give it's, it a. It's, you don't need to see this. I'm going to give it a low C as someone who liked the other two. And uh, if you're probably going to, if you like the other two, you're going to want to see how it ends. There's good stuff in it. There's fun hmm. action in it. There's some good bits. Uh, but yeah, this is easily the worst of the whole franchise. <laughs> and I think it's time to just put it to bed. I think we're good. Can I, I, I think that, we're over. I don't think there's anywhere to go. Yeah, I think there's other reasons why Divergent failed. Is that you watch the second movie? Hmm. Second movie has an ending. Second yeah. movie has an ending that, like, if this is where it ended, that would be fine. I don't think people felt the need to revisit it if they only saw the movies. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, there's more? What do they need more? It's over. You, you don't yeah. need to go anywhere further than that. That's a perfectly satisfying Twilight Zone ending. We're good. No, there's just more violence. In, just- in Allegiant, it's just like, and, and the hero turns out it, she's even more violent. Oh, great. 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 Thanks. She's, she's even angrier now. Well, speaking of violence, <laughs> uh, let's, let's review... Mm-hmm. Uh, all the Lethal Weapon movies, as selected by our Facebook fans. Yeah, Once a month we do a, a series. We polled yeah. you, and this is the series you chose. And Lethal Weapon uh, is one of the most successful action franchises ever. It's also one of the mm-hmm. most consistent. It had the same actors, same director, mm-hmm. uh, same think, writers a lot of the time. I think 2, 3, and 4 had the same writers. The first one was written by Shane, co-written by Shane Black. And Shane Black... Uh, uh, well, it was his script originally, and then they it was reworked a bit okay. to be a little less dark and, and violent. And then he came up with a script for the second one, and then they only used pieces of it. Mm-hmm. And they brought in uh, uh, another writer, and then they brought in another writer to join the fray on Lethal Bo- Open 3. Bo- and, Bo- it was Bo's Yakin, I think. Uh, no, it was uh, Robert Mark Kamen. Robert, Robert that's right. Uh, and uh, then, uh, yeah, and then for Lethal Weapon 4, they had Channing Gibson. Um, but, uh, yeah, the writing changed, but it was all guided under the hand mm-hmm. of Joel Silver, Richard Donner, and the main stars, uh, Danny Glover and mm-hmm. Mel Gibson. Yeah. And it was basically became the mm. buddy cop movie. It, it became the model. And, um, it, buddy cop movies pre exist. <clears throat> they pre existed. Well, yeah. I think 48 Hours was the first one to really do it. Uh, no. Uh, I think or is I, Lethal I, Weapon was I, Lethal Weapon first. No, no, Freebie and the Bean. Well, Freebie and the Bean. With, like, yeah. Alan Arkin and... Um, yeah. The mismatched... Co- it was essentially... Oh, who, was, the, who was the other one in Freebie and the Bean? But that's Peter, the one Peter that... Peter Falk. Uh, but... I think it was Peter Falk. Uh, Freebie... 
and the Bean. Uh, James Conn and Alan Arkin. Oh, James Conn. Yeah, yeah, that was the first like sort of mismatched, wacky mm. uh, buddy cop. The, the odd couple that cops. Um, yeah, and then that uh, that basically <clears throat> got perfected to mm. some people's minds in the first Lethal mm. Weapon about 13 years later yeah. and, with 1987. Yeah. So the shtick with Lethal Weapon, um, we have Martin Riggs, who is a suicidal cop. And he's just crazy. Uh, he since, since he's suicidal, he's willing to do pretty nutty things and put his life in danger. Uh, the first film is actually really good about addressing his suicidal feelings. It's actually pretty dark. Well, I think the first... And he, there's a therapist who's actually really concerned about him, and what they do to her character is shameful. They make her but, the butt of terrible jokes because mm. she has feelings. And mm. what's really frustrating, when you look at that, the first Lethal Weapon is a badass action movie. True. Mm. It's a funny comedy. True, it's a very sensitive film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. about people. It's about people in tough, tough guy jobs mm. who have feelings and how, how, and how they deal the end with of, that. They're at the end of their rope. And yeah, he's yeah. he's paired off with a family man, Danny Glover, who is uh, I don't want to say he's the straight laced one, but he's the one who's sort of the, he's the straight man. He's the sure. normal yeah. cop. He's he's a he's he's an older cop. He just turned fifty mm-hmm. first uh, on the first scene. Or the, his first scene in the movie, um, and he's just good. He does his job. He mm-hmm. does it well. He's 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 his, not corrupt. He's just he's a good cop. And then he finds out his partner is a guy who everyone at the office thinks is trying to get what they think is psycho pension. If he says that he has post traumatic stress or something, mm-hmm. then he can just take the money, walk out, and it's fine. And what he realizes over the course of a very dramatic first day with his new partner, <laughs> in which he, like, he jumps off a building to try to get a suicide guy to survive, just, just pushes him off the building onto like, like, he, the cushion. He, he grabs the guy and jumps off the building with him. Which is a great scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like after this horrible thing in which uh, he says, well, fine, if you want to kill yourself, do it now. And they, you want me to do it? And he just puts the gun like in his mouth oh. and put it by the side of his head. Like, And it's just, he's gonna do it. Mm. And he realizes... Oh, you actually are really hurting. Yeah, yeah. And it turns out he's hurting because his <laughs> wife would died in a car accident. Mm. What's interesting is that they really don't talk about what happened in the first movie. Well, and, and it's I, all about I think just it, how it affected him. Yeah, because she's just gone. She's out of his mm-hmm. life. He's moved into this little tiny spot on the beach. Yeah, which, it's got, it, which it's is now kind of it's now a cliche. I remember they made fun of it in National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon One, where he yeah. has this little trailer. He goes inside, and the interior is like this gigantic mansion. Right. But uh, yeah, he he just lives in this tiny trailer, and yeah, he's he's a sad character. He's funny. You mm-hmm. like him, but you relate to him because you can kind of recognize his hurt. And yeah. over the course of their investigating the, the central crime in the movie, the central crimes are kind of meaningless in this whole series. Mostly, yeah. It's just basically it's bad just guy a, plot. Oh, bad number, guy. Yeah. And, 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 and fact, eventually it gets personal. In Lethal it. Weapon 2, it's like, what are you up to? Oh, you're just doing crimes. <laughs> it's like, for no reason. A bunch of different crimes for no reason. Yeah, there's no ma- grand yeah. scheme afoot. But yeah, no, they, they just run afoul of these of these badasses. Mm-hmm. And what happens over the course Oh, and of it takes place during Christmas time because it's a Shane Black scripts. Of course. There's a shootout in a Christmas tree lot. But, the, you know, that's just the plot. What mm. it's about mm. is about a guy who is alone, and he has a great speech. Mel Gibson mm. has a great speech about how every morning he wakes up and he tries to think of a reason not to kill himself. Mm. And every morning, the reason he comes up with is, the I'm job. a cop. Yeah. I have responsibilities. Mm. I go to work. People live. Mm. People are, don't get killed. Justice and is served. And, and it's his, his exposure to Danny Glover's character, who has his life together and has a wife and has children. He doesn't envy that. He's definitely an outsider, but Danny Glover is so warm and so welcoming that he actually starts to be kind of welcomed as part of this family he's and understands st- that he can actually be part of this again. He's a stray dog. Yeah, yeah. That's and, what he is. He's, he's the he's stray dog. He's, he's taken in by this family. He's a little feral and he gets tamed a little bit mm. over the course of the film. And that is a very emotionally satisfying, rather tender mm. uh, a storyline for a movie that has fucked up violence and torture. <laughs> it has a lot of really horrible It's a violence. really brutal this, motion picture. This whole series has a lot of violence. And, you know, you, we feel sorry for Riggs, but over the course of, of Lethal Weapon 2, he how many people does he murder? Like a thousand? A million he's, people! He just, he just takes off his shirt and starts beating people to death with his fists <laughs> at some point. Like, uh, okay... 
I think you're moving past mourning for your wife at this point and tapping into something like much deeper and much darker well, in your psyche. Uh, we're going to talk about Lethal Weapon 2 in a minute because mm. my like opinions on Lethal Weapon 2 changed a bit, but I think there's mm. I think Lethal Weapon 2 is a really rock solid movie, but I think it probably should have been the end of the franchise, and I'll tell you about why. But mm, like all right. this first one, I think it's just really remarkable to look at the original Lethal Weapon and how it's not as polished as some of the other ones. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel as clean and sort of blockbustery. It is a remarkably well shot movie. Mm. I rewatched this and I'm watching, I'm like, holy shit. Some of the photography in this, like half of it just looks like any other cop movie. And then you'll just see a shot and you realize that shot is insanely dynamic <laughs> and they just sort of hit it in this movie. Like there's a shot when they're, uh, they're going over to the house of someone who they think may have been involved in the murder of a young woman. Mm. A woman is uh, murdered at the beginning of the movie. Well, she, well, she, she commits, commits suicide, suicide, but it turns out she was poisoned and she would have died anyway. Right. It's a it, fun little twist. Uh, not a, for her, but it's for a, the audience. It's, it's an a interesting... very, very Shane Black, I love film noir opening where mm-hmm. this, this woman, nude woman, she's like wearing mm-hmm. it's like really diaphanous gown and she's drinking and she's like, clearly she's waiting for a lover, but then she throws herself over the balcony. It's like, yeah, that's Raymond Chandler right and, there. And yeah. then it turns out she, she, even though she committed suicide, she was also a murder victim because she had already been poisoned mm. and she didn't know it. What a setup. That's a great setup for a crime movie. But then you watch it, and I'm like, there's there's a shot where they're going over to this woman who they think might be involved, and they're just walking to her house, and she's I guess she's close to LAX, and there's this big uh, plane that's mm. landing in the background, and you can hear it, and it's a real plane. They couldn't fake that shit back then. Oh. And then as the plane hits the building, it, it, it explodes. It explodes, it's, and it's all one shot. It's like, how how did you do that? How that's, do you time that? Was, it's that an, was that just lucky? It was an amazing... Amazing shot. There's another shot where um, um, after it gets personal and the bad guys, uh, one of them played by Gary Busey, who's a, this was a big career jump starter for him. After well, he's, he's just a supporting character. But he yeah. is, but he was. This was when he started playing heavies. Mm. He was just another actor. He was. He was Buddy Holly. He won an Oscar nomination for the Buddy Holly story. Good performance. Uh, but now he was the bad guy in movies, and this is what he would carry him throughout the rest of his career. He's an under siege and stuff like that. Yeah, um, but like they kidnap. Uh, Murtaugh's, Danny Glover's character's uh, daughter, mm. and there's going to be a big exchange in the desert. And first off, it's fucking awesome. Like, it's so well filmed. Like, they just they just plow through the desert in their car, and Mel Gibson just jumps out and runs with a sniper rifle. <laughs> They're like, holy shit! <laughs> but there's this amazing shot. Go, watch When you're watching the movie again, and I know you will, because it's a good movie. Uh, I, I know we all have problems with Mel Gibson, but and that's fine if you don't want to ever watch him again. I understand, but this is still a good movie regardless. There, there was a reason he was a movie star. Yeah, he, it's, it's yeah. On. Before we knew he was a jerk. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, there's a shot of all the bad guys coming through the desert. And it's in the, it's in the desert and there are heat waves mm. coming off of the ground. And they use this incredibly long lens. If you don't know how lenses work, there's basically three basic lenses you use in any movie. There's a regular lens, which basically approximates the typical field of vision. Mm. Everything, like, as you look right now, everything is as far away, looks as far away as it actually is. There are wide-angle lenses, which make everything look really far away. Like, it, mm. you get, like, a bigger vista. It just really sells depth. And then there are long lenses, which compress space. And they make things really far away look really close. So you've got a guy, like, silhouetted against the background, like, a caravan of cars and a helicopter all coming through the desert. Like, this incredible western. Mm. And they all look the same size. And it is great cinematography. <laughs> just it's, this big threat looming over the horizon. There, there's a scene where like Riggs and Murtaugh are like just before they do that and the, there's been the kidnapping and it's Christmas and they're they're lit by red Christmas lights and they're saying it's going to get bloody. Mm. And I'm like it is right now. I think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. Yeah. Mm. Um yeah, this is a good movie. It's a good movie. Yeah. I, I really like the first lethal weapon. Yeah. Uh before we uh, were rewatching these for this podcast, I had only seen the first and the fourth. Oh. I hadn't seen Lethal Weapon two and three, and I was assured uh, by many people, my wife included, that Lethal Weapon two is just an unbelievable classic. And I w- I'm sad to report that I kind of hated it. Um, oh. uh, I-, I didn't. I didn't hate it, but you know, it's it's. It's what I call Beverly Hills Cop Syndrome. I didn't see Beverly Hills Cop until I was in my 30s. -hmm. I didn't see it when it first came out. And so I was raised on the films that were imitating it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of surpassed what it was doing. Kind of took what Beverly Hills Cop did, 
po- spit polished it, shined it, added you know much more dynamic plot elements and characters, and made them into better films. So I go back to watch Beverly Hills Cop, and it's it's just sort of blah. It's, a, it's, it's a like a messy it's, it's, film. It's a messy film, and it feels cliched. And it's kind of you have to remind yourself that this is where a lot of that stuff started. Yeah. And I feel the same way about Lethal Weapon Two. Interesting. Um, a lot of the the action tropes and the way this story was told has been redone and rehashed in so many other cop movies and TV shows that it feels like it's a tired retread when really this is where a lot of this stuff started. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel as dynamic as it once did. Uh, the way it's the way it's plotted and the way the characters are handled, uh, it takes a lot of the edge, uh, the... Um, the shabbiness off of the first one. This is a slick movie. Oh, yeah. It is a super, super Opens slick Opens with a glorious car chase. Yeah, it's got really, really great action. Um, it turns the pain that um, the Mel Gibson character, Martin Riggs, felt in the first one and kind of very subtly turns it into machismo. Yeah, I know. And I th- that. I, that doesn't sit well with me, that he's he's actually kind of cold and aloof because he's just a macho dude. Well, here's my problem And they start with turning the therapist who cares about him into a joke. Yeah. They add this... It gets real bad by I know. I know a lot of people like the Joe Pesci character, but he's kind of dead weight in this movie. Okay, I'm they, gonna, I'll they, defend the Joe Pesci character. Okay. Here's what I'll... Okay, there's there's a couple of things going on right now with what you're saying, and mm-hmm. let's, let's take them one at a time. Uh, so, in this movie, we're introduced to a new character named Lee Leo Getz, played by Joe Pesci. Uh, Leo is uh, a and stool pigeon. He's a lob, mob informant who, yeah. they, who Riggs and Murtaugh have to protect. Yeah, uh, uh, and actually they're, they're, t- they're told to protect this guy to get them off the case because the opening bid uh, is they actually find out that a diplomat from South oh. Africa, and this is actually a very political movie, they do Play- a lot of apartheid rants. Played by Joss Ackland. Yes, from, from Bill from, and Ted's from Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey yeah. and the Apple and every like horrible B movie. The basic premise yeah, is, is they great. know he's the bad guy mm. right away, and they can do nothing because he has diplomatic immunity. Now I'm pretty sure that's not exactly how diplomatic immunity no, and, works. And in fact, like he kills somebody late in the movie and just like pulls out a badge and says diplomatic immunity. I'm pretty sure we can still detain you. <laughs> I I'm just pretty sure that's not good. Guy. So anyway. It's such, a great, it's such a great premise because it sounds you know that someone read about it and then it's like don't do any more research you'll ruin it it sounds <laughs> Wait, so much cooler on the surface diplomatic immunity is a thing sure let's let, let, let them do anything that was the gag in Marvel Comics for a long time about how Doctor Doom could get away with doing everything and still rule a country is he had diplomatic immunity anytime he was in America because <laughs> he was Jeez. the only diplomat from Latveria great idea no, but, no it's, but, that's a cheap plot point is what that but is. the idea is Riggs and Murtaugh are like harassing this diplomat and mm. so they get him off of that they decide to uh, just was given this bullshit job protecting Leo Uh and it turns out Leo actually was gonna snitch on that guy yeah so it all it all works out our cases they're the same case but um that moment the thing about Leo that I think is actually makes him a fun character Mm -hmm. is he's actually like a good fan service character he is actually Mm -hmm. excited to be there he really I, wants to be helpful. He's very uh, eager to help the police. It's basically, you watch a buddy cop movie, you say to yourself, I, not an action person, not mm-hmm. not someone who like was in the Vietnam War and a total badass now, like, I would like to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. That's Leo. And he's fun in that in that way. He's helpful because he has information, mm-hmm. but he's just a fun character because he adds this dynamic of someone who's just like, this is neat! <laughs> oh my god! Like and Joe Pesci is a very likable actor, so mm. I think he's fine in this one. I well, think they, uh, they try too hard to shoehorn him into the other ones, but I think this one he's okay. What I kind of appreciate about the the Joe Pesci character, Leo Getz, is that he uh, in the first movie a lot of the the screenplay is based around kind of the way the two characters bicker. And it sounds really improvised, although I'm sure it was pretty strictly scripted. I, th- I um, get the impression a lot of it was 80 yard. Maybe so. But yeah, yeah, like there's a lot of shots of just a car passing away and they're just sort of yammering at each other. Yeah. And, um, you get the, the sense that they're kind of at odds and you get you understand the characters right away. They're an odd couple. By inserting Leo Getz into this equation, now you have these two people kind of unifying against him because he's the chatterbox. Mm. And he's just sort of, he's the one who's yammering all the time and they just say, shut up, Leo. Yeah. <laughs> shut up, Donnie. Yeah. He's, he's the cousin. Element. Yeah. Like, so, uh, and I appreciate that that kind of strengthens the Riggs Murtaugh relationship, that they actually have this new thing in common. They both hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that they're, they're both, and you know, Riggs is so, uh, 
kind of blasé and to, to, be, to be frank kind of cruel to in fact there's a scene in, in lethal weapon four yeah where uh leo is talking Leo's, about how Leo's they're talking good about friends like, you're, you're you're like my best friend and he actually rightfully says leo we've been horrible to you <laughs> we, we don't like you we just we torture like you he all feels the time. bad about it but yeah. like yeah you've been the butt of our jokes like the whole time and leo's just yeah. like best i got so, yeah so he's, he's <laughs> They're really cruel to this guy. Yeah. And, you know, Murtaugh is actually learning to loosen up by being cruel to this guy. So yeah. I appreciate what's happening between Riggs and Murtaugh, but I, I, I'm only slightly uncomfortable at the fact that they're just really, really mean to Leo Gaz. The, the problem We're supposed to love him and hate him at the same time. Okay, so listen, the action is amazing. The villain is fun. There's some mm. great action sequences. There's a whole bit where there's, like, this house on stilts on, like, the side of a hill mm. in Los Angeles, which they actually do, and it's, like, so fucking stupid. Because it's just <laughs> mudslides and wildfires, and it's the worst possible place to build a house. But people do it anyway because and, it makes them feel big wealthy people do it yeah too. yeah it's insane no one can no one can afford the worst property in california <laughs> so rich people build houses on stilts so that they'll fall apart and there's this bit where like that land is technically like south african soil and they can't do anything about it and when mel gibson gets sufficiently pissed off he like ties a chain to the stilts and just puts pulls on his the truck house and down, pulls yeah. the house down great bit mm. amazing bit again how does this guy have a job i don't know this guy is a, like in the first one he was called a maniac but he was suicidal it was really sensitive about yeah. his psychology in this one he's just a maniac well but this one this one it pushes him over the edge again so he's mm. feeling good he's got a family he finally actually for the first time starts dating again yeah, yeah patsy kensett mm. uh, a young actress who was reasonably well known for a while and kind of just people don't talk her. about her anymore mm. and she's perfectly good and um they have a nice little romance and then it turns out that uh, I want to call him Gert Frobe. What's the name of the guy who's uh, uh, the the South African bad guy again? Joss Ackland. Joss Ackland. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I always want to think he's he's Goldfinger. He's not. Uh, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah, he's like lead hench person. Mm. Uh, turns out, not only does he kill Patsy Kensett, but he tells Riggs. By the way. I killed your wife. I, I was the bad guy in the car. Blah, ha, ha. Uh-huh. And, the, and that, what uh, they think they're doing, I'm going to go on for a rant here. What I think they're okay, doing. Okay, Dennis Miller. I think what they're doing is they're trying to give Riggs a certain amount of closure. Mm. There was actually talk after uh, for a while that he would die at the end of this movie. That oh, was wow, that, okay. that was originally one of the thoughts that he would die huh. at the end of this movie, and that would be the end of the franchise. Um, and it would have made sense because he gets the closure, he he gives in to his animalistic impulses, he stops the bad guys, and then he's done. That's the problem. Mm. What you have with the Lethal Weapon movies is you have a series of films in which the characters take you through. There's no plot mm. that that's consistent through it. It's just different yeah, adventures. The, the the bad guy, yeah, we mentioned it already. The bad guy is up to all kinds of evil malfeasance yeah. and he's not trying to accomplish anything. Not generally, it's he's pretty just, straightforward. He just likes doing evil things variously. Mostly that's the case. Mm. So what we've got here is we just want to see these characters go. And this is the thing when you have a franchise based on a, a character like this, mm. the character can't they never achieve, ever achieve closure. Can't, can't achieve closure. They can't become a different person. Mm. The most stories about someone changing mm. and then becoming a different person. The obvious example is like a Christmas Carol. He's a bad person. He's a good person mm. at the end. Uh, as good as it gets. He's a bad person. He's a good person at the end. Breaking Bad. He's a good person. He's a bad person. <laughs> you, but once he's once it's done, it's just done. Mm. It's one of the reasons I think people didn't like uh, The Dark Knight Rises because Batman like retired, yeah, and there's yeah. like he changed. Like, yeah, what if he did? I thought that made the movie uh, interesting. Uh, uh, people don't like w- that. One of the more interesting superhero movies. People don't yeah. like it. The whole reason we come back is because these characters don't change. This movie changed Riggs, and it kind of closed out his story. Yeah, it well, gave him all of the all I'm, of the vengeance, all the vendetta. I didn't and see I think it it's as done. I didn't see it as a very positive ending. As the no, problem. it's not. It's, but it, it is an ending. Like it, it would end with him. There's two ways you can end his story. <clears throat> Either he is redeemed, he stops being a cop, and he gets married and has a child, which is eventually what happens. Oh, well, he could be. Co- why can't he be? Yeah. Stop- why does he have to stop being a cop? Well, because he can still just be a cop. Too, too, too much. Like he says that the only thing he's living for is the job, and coming to a point where he realizes that he doesn't need that, he can be a person again, would be a good way to close out his story. Oh, I can see that. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, or you have what happened in Lethal Weapon 2. He faces violently the darkness within him. Mm-hmm. And he sees that this bad guy killed his wife. And Patsy Kensett dr- drowns in front of his eyes. Yeah. Like, it's she, really fucked up. Uh, yeah. it's it, And, you know, 
I, I wish that their relation, they, it's given a lot of time, their relationship. Mm-hmm. And there's this like long sequence in the middle of the film where they're just sort of dating and having mm-hmm. a good, good time. They got great chemistry together. They're nice. I, I feel like a little bit more than just sexual chemistry would have done. It would have been nice <laughs> if they had a yeah, relationship. Had an re- actual relationship yeah, that lasted they, a while. Because they only knew each other for a couple of days, really. Yeah, and, and they fall into bed and they're great in bed together. And turns out. Turns out, okay, that's a Sweet. good thing to go on, but a yeah. little more, please. Um, and he literally rips off his shirt. <laughs> He's shirtless throughout like most of the third act of this movie. And goes on a, a Patrick Swayze murder spree, like in Roadhouse, <laughs> where he just starts ripping out guys' throats and shooting guys that he just hates. And this should be this is sold as something that's really kind of fun and cathartic. Mm-hmm. And I'm clutching my chest saying, No, stop murdering people, Riggs. Well, it's interesting because this is actually And if it had ended with that and he ends up going to prison <laughs> and, you know, facing the fact that he just had all of his darkness in him and now he has to live with that in prison mm. would be a good way to end it. But it's depressing, it's, but what are you gonna it, do? It would be right? depressing, but it would be the it would be emotionally logical. Yeah. The way it's sold is like in so many movies do like Commando. You kidnapped my daughter, so now I have license to murder a thousand men. Yeah, like she's not even dead. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, she wasn't even hurt. She was just kidnapped. I mean, for it's, goodness it's sake. bad. It's, of course, I, it's I, bad. I, but, I, I think that one, like, I kind of get it. But, but like, but you know, chucking rotary saws at guys' heads is like. <laughs> Something you wanted to do there's outside a, of your daughter being kidnapped. There's a, there's a lot of collateral damage in the Lethal Weapon movies that I don't think it's talked about enough. And I'm not just talking about, like, they introduce, like, a whole supporting cast of characters in Lethal Weapon 2 who get killed brutally, like, in The Dark Knight. Oh. That whole sequence where just ev- the Joker kills everybody. Yeah. Like, there's a, like there's just the sequence of just, like, for example, like, Dean Norris, before he was in Breaking Bad, mm-hmm. when he was only 50. Like, he doesn't <laughs> look young. He's still got the hair and everything like that, but, like, he whatever. Like, he's he, he gets killed. Jeanette Goldstein Vasquez yeah, from Aliens. Yeah, yeah. Jeanette Goldstein is great, not only because she's a fun actor and she didn't, she should have had a bigger career than she did. Uh, but you know her as Vasquez from Aliens, you know the tough, the tough lady. She, she, she's been in all of James Cameron's movies, pretty much. And she, she was an Irish immigrant in Titanic. Yeah. Um, I don't know. think she was an Avatar. She was uh, Eddie Furlong's mom in Terminator Two, uh, uh, like foster mom. Foster yeah, mom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ever since Alien, she was she was in all this stuff, and she's great. And actually, she owns uh, she runs like one of the best bra stores in the uh, world, which is like a mile from us. It's called Jeanette yeah. Bras. Yeah, and she just she makes bras for for sure. women who don't fit the Victoria's Secret like mm-hmm. just off the rack well, mold. Well, she specifically to busty women. The the, mm-hmm. the the slogan of the store is the alphabet begins at D. Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she opened right next door to a place where I used to work. It's right next mm-hmm. to the New Art Theater. Yeah. And evidently she went into the video store and talked to the clerk. It's like, hey, I'm going to open up a bra store. It's like, that's great, Jeanette Goldstein. It's also nice to meet you, Jeanette Goldstein, movie star. I recognize you. And she actually did this. She leaned in. She put her elbow on the counter, looked this guy straight in the eyes and say, hey, Jeremy, you like big tits? Oh my <laughs> like, God. And I guess he, it's like, he asked so directly, he said, well, Sure. <laughs> it's like, well, you're going to love my store because it's all about big tits. Like, oh, well, thanks, yeah. Jet Goldstein. I guess Neat. Y- you're sympathetic to the large breasted woman. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But then she she was losing business. So she opened up a second store called Flattery. Oh, I you get play, it. You get it there? I get it, yeah. which, is, which is not for busty women. Oh, there so, you go. Um, the other but thing, she makes good underwear. <laughs> the other thing I think is interesting about Lethal Weapon 2 that we kind of just mentioned briefly mm-hmm. is um, it's really anti-apartheid. Now, of course, it should be anti-apartheid. Yeah. Apartheid was brutal and terrible, and I'm glad it's over. But this was a really political blockbuster. Mm. It was, there's a whole sequence that, where, that's like... That's what was going on in the news at the time. Yeah. Was, was, you know, the, the corrupt South African but, government. But, like, a lot, of movies, a lot of movies today, they try to stay out of stuff like that. Mm. You know, you, like you, you look at like um, we've had a lot of disagreements over how Captain America: The Winter Soldier handled its politics, where yeah, they used I, I, they I used think... coding of like fictional Nazis mm. basically to talk about you know people Corruption who have taken over the government. The government. Yeah. Like, but this would be like if they actually pointed fingers. At an actual real group, well, that, like that's that's, 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 kind, that's kind of what I wanted from Captain America. I, I know, and I, I, I admire like, Lethal I Weapon like the, Two. The, I admire the, Lethal Weapon Two for doing yeah. it. I mean, they they turned them into cartoon bad guys, but at least they were very very clear about where their mm-hmm. morality and their ethics and their politics lie. There's a good sequence where, uh, in order to create a diversion, they go into the consulate. They go into the consulate, and Danny Glover this is, is a good scene. Yeah. yeah, Joe Pesci takes Danny Glover in, and Danny Glover says he wants to move to South Africa, and like the white South African who's there, he's just like. 
why? And he's like, well, he's like it's, it's great. My, my people are there. And, he's a, and he actually says to his face, but you're black. <laughs> and then Danny Glover, of course, explodes and creates a huge <laughs> scene. And it's just sort of like, yeah, this is an interesting sort of moment to, to sort of capture in a big blockbuster action movie. Uh, I want to pause for a second on Danny Glover. Because mm-hmm. uh, this movie is really more about Riggs than it is about Murtaugh and the relationship Riggs has with Murtaugh. It's just Murtaugh. You, Murtaugh. Don't, you don't pronounce uh, the G. Okay, it's, it's G-H. It's a soft. Uh, Murtaugh. Yeah. Uh, and Murtaugh is, he has sort of a, a limper backstory in that he's, he frets about his daughter. That's kind of like what he's got throughout he, most of these He's movies. not like working through any serious emotional baggage. Yeah. He's and, just feeling old. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting, he coined the I'm getting too old for this shit line, which he repeats in Maverick, which came out in between Lethal Weapon <laughs> oh, 3 that's and right, 4. I forgot, I forgot yeah, that he, he has, forgot he has, he has a, a little, little cameo. cameo in yeah. there. Um, but uh, Danny Glover understands this character down to the bone. Uh, Mel Gibson is kind of playing off his own charm. He's playing a Mel Gibson type. Mm. Danny Glover is playing a part, and he's doing it quite well. Yeah. Uh, he understands that this guy is not in a rut. He's just sort of s- set. And it's interesting to see this guy who is set coming up against all of these different challenges. I think I like the dynamic scene by scene that Murtaugh has with the action around him than Riggs, who is kind of a loose cannon. Well, it's actually just, it's nice to see a character in a movie like this who is well put together, Mm -hmm. who is healthy, who has a family, who is, by the way, played by the same actors, even the kids throughout Mm -hmm. all of the movies. Even the kids and the wife, yeah, it's all great. That's an incredible amount of continuity that most people would never bother with. (laughs) And all of those actors are really fun. (laughs) <laughs> but like all of those actors are really, really fun, and they create a real family mm. dynamic. And in the first one, again, this serves a purpose. It's about taking in a stray dog. Mm. But like just throughout, it's it's very warm and welcoming. But it's a it, problem is that 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 warm and welcoming feeling infects *Lethal Weapon* three and four, mm. which become just slick. But really generic and bland yeah, yeah, yeah. action movies. Well, I mean, like like you said, the the story is over for yeah. these guys, and now they're just cops. Now they're what, just what buddy do do cops now? who uh, have no baggage. Yeah, and <laughs> we're so, done. So in the third one, Leo gets his back for some reason. <laughs> they were here's the deal. Okay, this is actually three and four were like these huge. Like pre, th- pre development nightmare movies where they I had a bunch th- of different drafts, and yeah, I think three made the most money. Oh, three, three was a three, huge hit. Three and four were big hits. Yeah, they, they all made a lot of money. I think four was like the least successful overall. It was like opening a bigger summer or something. But um, it was many years later, though. It was like it was like, de- ninety eight later. Yeah. You know? um, but the you know Joe Pesci's character wasn't even going to be in three. They were mm. just going to have a line saying, "Oh yeah, he moved to New York." Done. Uh, and then uh, they they brought him back. They liked him, and he has nothing to do. Yeah, he's got a f- couple of funny scenes, but like that's I, it. I think they had to keep the dynamic alive to have Riggs and Murtaugh uh, sort of speak out against this guy, well, have like a mutual hateable character. Even, but he's not around. Is the thing? There's no reason for him to be around. The, uh, uh, Leo gets at this point in this movie. He has become a realtor, mm. and he is trying to sell Murtaugh's house. And there is a funny scene where he's got this prospective buyers mm. in the house. And uh, they, he has to full disclosure. He has to tell him everything that's ever happened in the house. Yeah, people and, have like there've been like gunfights and deaths in the house. Oh, we yeah. forgot. We didn't even mention like one of the best scenes in *Lethal Weapon* too is when uh, Murtaugh goes missing for like sixteen hours, and it turns out he's been on his toilet the whole time because there's a bomb attached to the toilet. And, and he if can't if he, if he gets stands up, up and blows explode, up. Yeah. And what I love about that scene, I really wish I should have talked about that scene. That scene. Well, that's, that's the scene where they really bond. Actually, that's a yeah. really important. That's a scene that if they did that scene today, mm. it would be so crass. There would be poop jokes. <laughs> yeah. There would be uh, uh, sort of you know, oh, I can see your wiener jokes. There would just be like this really. I, I can't imagine anyone doing it with the class uh, it's of actually, Lethal Weapon 2. This is actually about, it's on the in the toilet, not because they want toilet humor, although watching the toilet land on the hood of a car is definitely a, a laugh moment. It's a funny moment. But uh, it's more about the intimacy that they have yeah. now achieved. He's been in this house, he knows this bathroom, mm. he knows this guy well enough that they can actually like hold hands and say, you know what, this is embarrassing. We understand this is embarrassing, but... It's okay. We we don't have to be embarrassed by this. We're that close now. Yeah, this is about we, survival we have, right now. We have that intimacy now as as friends and, and as and family turns, members. And it and turns out the, okay. the only thing they can do is basically they have this big cast iron bathtub. They have a big bomb protective you know cover. Mm. All they can really do is freeze the bomb that'll slow down the timer, pull them off of there, and then just get in the tub. Get in the and, tub and, and hope to survive. And yeah, it's insanely dangerous. And there's a long moment. Where they're just like talking, this is this could be the end of both of us, mm. and they play it for real. Mm. 
and it's a great scene on a toilet with a bomb. <laughs> Holy shit. It's great. Mm-hmm. Lethal Weapon 3 doesn't really have that. Lethal Weapon 3, uh, there's a new bad guy played by Stuart Wilson, who's mm-hmm. also the main bad guy in... I, I, I almost called him Stuart Whitman, and that's a different I, There's guy, a lot yeah. of Stuarts out there, but... Uh, also, <laughs> Profound. He, there's a lot of Stuarts out there. What you think? Uh, he was like a go-to bad guy in the 90s who people don't talk about very much anymore, mm-hmm. but like he was the main bad guy in The Mask of Zorro, which is a great movie. <laughs> he was the main bad guy in No Escape, which is also a great movie. People don't talk about it enough. The original No Escape with like Ray Liotta, not like the oh, okay. Wilson one, which I actually think is a little underrated, but what are you going to do? Um, but yeah, so he is an ex-cop who has started up his own gang. Gun, gun running business. Yeah, yeah, and the gag is, and they figure this out over the course of the film, is he's getting all of his drugs and weapons from police evidence lockers, because he knows how the system works and mm-hmm. he's able to steal it without anyone knowing. That's a... F- that's an interesting that's premise. A good enough premise. That's a good premise. I can, I can handle that. That's that's and, kind of fun. And they stop him at the end. They basically stop him. <laughs> the, the only so Lethal Weapon Three has some cool action sequences. It ends in like this big like uh, you know they're putting up a whole community full of houses and the whole thing is on fire and mm-hmm. it's really cool and there's more cool car chases and that's really cool. Lethal Weapon Three really is all about Rene Russo. She's the uh, uh, internal affairs officer who's yeah. been uh, investigating all of this. And uh, she, it, it's actually really tactful, at least at the beginning, uh, how they treat her because she kind of hates Riggs and Murtaugh. Mm-hmm. She does. She feels that they are loose cannons. She's not really sure what they're up to because they're loose cannons. These guys could be corrupt for all she knows. Well, and they abuse their and, power a lot. Uh, they, like, they sure do. Yeah. And uh, and she's savvy to this, and she calls them on it. And that she and Riggs will eventually develop an attraction doesn't feel f- like a foregone conclusion when she walks right. on screen. It's not like, oh, they hate each other and soon they're going to fall in love. No, they could still hate each other at the end of this movie. Yeah. They, and they, that would have been fine. They do. And in fact, they actually have really, really great chemistry together. There's this whole bit where they're comparing each other's scars and she sees how much of a badass she is. She gets a lot of fight I, scenes. But, she, but then Riggs uses that as an excuse just to take off all his clothes and say, hey, look, but I'm, she's, I'm studly she, early 90s Mel Gibson. What do you think? Deal. She's into it, too. She just like wants to put a stop to it because they're professional but she's into it she's mm-hmm. totally like on board and they're fun together she gets a cool, bunch of cool action sequences here's a fun fact pretty much all her dialogue was written by carrie fisher oh no kidding yeah all right um but uh why, why, why she's such a, a hard-nosed actual character and not just yeah. not just a babe like she, patsy kensett yeah she she really uh, uh you she's a match mm-hmm. for for Riggs, which i which i really really like but yeah the movie is kind of forgettable and doesn't really like well, do much and then but it, it when i was watching four which is yeah. a mess when i was watching lethal weapon 2 and all throughout lethal weapon 3 and 4 i guess it's it just you know I'm not sure how many people get this, but action sequences just don't do much. Just a chase does nothing Mm -hmm. for me emotionally anymore. It's like, okay, the movie stopped and we just sort of have to wait for the action sequence to end. I don't really feel thrilled. I'm not really invested in the, like, all I want to know is how it turns out. Right. There's a bit in the and middle there's where... Like big, yeah, and big shootouts and big chases, oh. and they're all impressively staged, and they're all really, really well shot, and I'm wondering, okay, what, when, when are we going to find something in this scene? What's where, happening in Well, this because, scene? again, the whole emotional storyline of Riggs is over. They try to re- build something in the middle where Murtaugh, in the middle of a shooting, actually shoots a teenager who had a gun and was mm-hmm. trying to kill him, but it turns out it's a, it's a teenager the same that, age as his son, and his son knew. knew. Yeah. And he, there's a whole sequence on a boat where it's just him drunk, hating himself. Mm. A, a boat that's, it's not in the water. I think it's the one it is. Uh... No, no, it's, they, get, they end up in the water. Oh, they end they, up in the water. The boat's in the water. I, they I forgot up, they when it ended up in the, the ocean. Yeah. yeah. And like that whole sequence is really, really great because Danny Glover doesn't get enough to do, frankly, in a <laughs> lot of these movies. So they give him like the big emotional thing. Problem is, it's not really the point of the movie. It's his tacked on subplot. Mm-hmm. So it really doesn't go anywhere. There's also this weird tacked on subplot where Murtaugh thinks that uh, Mel Gibson is sleeping with his daughter, his like the oldest daughter, who's like an aspiring mm-hmm. actor. Um, and it turns out that's actually from an earlier version of the draft in which that's exactly what was happening. Oh, wow. And they just sort of left some of the bits in, so it's a misunderstanding. And that's the same thing that happened with Chris Rock's character in Lethal Weapon 4, oh. where he was one thing, they changed it, and there's a whole subplot that's just a vestigial remnant of how it actually <laughs> played out. <laughs> Lethal Weapon uh, 4 came along like six years later. And it came out in 98. And it was super rushed. It was <laughs> rushed into production because like the studio didn't have anything big coming out that summer. Mm. And in fact, they filmed it, and I think it was... The, they finished filming, and then it's like 33 or 34 days, I don't remember in front of me, it was in theaters. 
Wow. That's insane. For a film that size, that yeah, is insane. That's huge. It's a miracle it works at all. Mm. It shouldn't even be coherent. So the the shtick now is they're they're a little older. They look their age. Uh, yeah. Danny Glover, great shape, by the way. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Um uh, during an opening sequence where they're essentially fighting a Spider-Man villain. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> this guy in a suit of armor with a blowtorch and a, a machine gun. It's walking down the street shooting stuff for no reason. It, this is and weird. has nothing to do with the plot. There's this weird bit. like the, uh, All the Lethal Weapon movies open in these dynamic ways. The first one opens with, you know, a beautiful naked woman mm. taking drugs, falling off a building. It's very film noir. The second one is this huge car chase. We don't even see the crime that took place before the car chase. We just cut right to the middle of the car chase. Mm -hmm. And then third one was the bomb. There's a bomb and like a parking right, structure, right, right. And, and they blew and up a huge they blew building. Up this huge building. Yeah. It's insane. And then this one, yeah, which ends this, up going off at the end of the movie. Yeah, and then they just in, in a po did you stay for the post credit sequence? Oh yeah, in the post credit sequence, they go back to the building and and it's this is ADRs like why are we back here? Oh, oh, wait, right. Well, I guess they had to collapse the building anyway. Let's film it and put it in, and then add some dialogue saying, "Oh, let's go back to this building and get this thing I left." And oh no, we forgot to we forgot to disarm the other bomb, and it collapses. Yeah. It, it's the, so dumb. The fourth one opens with them fighting Heat Wave, like this, the uh. Flash villain. <laughs> like it doesn't really like it just, and it turns out that like they try to do this whole shtick where Riggs is just like, okay, he's super fucking dangerous. He's got two flamethrowers. He's blowing up trucks. I'll jump in there. I own, I have a girlfriend, but I have less to lose than you do. And then Murtaugh says, no way. I, I wasn't supposed to tell you, but you're going to be a father. I'll do it. And then Riggs is like, no, no, I wasn't supposed to tell you, but you're going to be a grandfather. And they're like, ah, oh. yeah. so. We're just going to do our weird thing anyway, which turns out to be Danny Glover stripping naked and doing a, doing a chicken the bad dance. Guy. Whatever. It's just the opening sequence. There's a thing they don't talk about enough here where they talk. I, I mentioned it a little bit, but like there's a lot of collateral damage in these movies. And in fact, there's actually a lot of people who like are thrown out of cars and then get like bad guys who are thrown out of cars and mm. then get hit by a truck. Yeah. And one thing I was I want I kept thinking about as I'm watching this, I'm like that poor bus driver. <laughs> like the guy who died was a murderer he's trying to kill a bunch of people I'm like I, I only have so much sympathy he's a human being maybe he didn't deserve to die but like you know the guy, I, I, but clearly the, guy the movie driving, is against him the guy yeah. driving the bus is an innocent who yeah. just murdered a guy yeah, that by guy's accident gonna, that guy's yeah. gonna have to live with that his mm. whole life he doesn't know what the hell's going on and then like so like he just stops the bus and he's like oh god mm. oh god <laughs> what happened I, I, I'm a murderer I and then he starts drinking, and then he like he's, he's love he's, to see a lethal weapon film. Like it starts with Riggs and Murtaugh, and there's a big action sequence, yeah. and then the rest of the movie is just about the bus. And his we home don't life see the falls cops, apart, right? and his kids hate him, and he just ends up <laughs> like it, it's really sad. And it happens to a lot of people. And he ends up like holding up a pawn shop, and then Mel Gibson arrests him, and it's just salt in the wound. There's this huge, uh, uh, there's this huge fucking car chase. Uh, mm -hmm. In Lethal Weapon Four, mm -hmm. where it's a cool bit, they're like chasing a guy down, and they're like, the, uh, Riggs jumps into a truck that's carrying a like house, a mobile house, yeah, yeah, and he's and then he drags the guy into the house, and he's fighting the guy inside the house on the on the thing and everything. And uh, what's crazy about it is there's two things that are crazy about this mm -hmm. sequence. One, none of the other cars on the freeway stop. Nobody slows down. Yeah, for this. Wilkins is dragging behind a truck on a table connected by a thin sheet of plastic, and everyone's just like, "Well, I'm late to that meeting. Better keep going." <laughs> oh, it's L.A. I see it every day. But that's the other funny thing about it. Mm. It's obviously not L.A. It's obviously not L.A. <laughs> they couldn't true. shoot the sequence in L.A., and the only place they could shoot it was outside of Las Vegas. So all of a sudden, in the middle of a car chase, they're in the fucking desert. Now, I know if you're not from L.A., you think it's all desert here. you got to drive a bit to hit to get real out of the desert. Yeah, yeah. To hit real desert like that. Like, um, it's, it's pretty yeah. obvious and ridiculous. The story involves the Chinese mafia, and this was Jet Li's American debut. Jet Li, who mm. is uh, obviously is one of the greatest mm. martial arts superstars in history, he had been making movies in China since like the mid '80s, mm. and he was a superstar. And, and he's and dozens and dozens of them as well. Oh yeah, he's, the Shaolin he's Temple very, movies, once very upon prolific. a time in uh, China, that and was amazing. Uh, and yeah, that he had not been in an American film yet. I think he was in this and in the one, like really close. I think to the each one other. was like shortly after yeah, this. But this is his big debut, and, he, and the big, uh, uh, almost controversy over it was for the first time he played a bad guy. 
Yeah, he was he a villain. Yeah. He, was, he was the villain in the film. And a lot of Chinese actors, you know, they don't want to play bad guys. They don't. Jackie Chan, I think, has it in his contract that he's not allowed to play a bad he guy. He was offered, I think, this role, Jackie Chan, and mm. he was also offered the bad guy role in Demolition Man, and he mm. said, I don't do bad guys. I, mm. It would betray my audience. I, I have a, a persona. Mm. And Jet Li was a little bit more willing to, to go on the other side of that. He's a Which is fun fine. villain. He's, he's, he's really threatening. Oh, he's, yeah. If anyone's going to kick the awesome. shit out of these okay. two guys, it's Jet Li. Jet Li does a stunt in... In this film, that is impossible. Like mm. beyond the laws of physics. Talk uh, about the gun. <clears throat> the gun. Yeah. There's a gun on the ground, and Riggs and Murtaugh are either side of him, and he needs to pick up the gun and and grab it while distracting these two who are on either side of him. And they film the shot in slow motion just so you can absorb what the hell is happening in this anti gravity stunt that he does, <laughs> because he is able to somehow invert his entire body like radially he turns upside down (laughs) he grabs the gun off of the floor while kicking both of them one with either leg (laughs) and then somehow like while in midair turning back the other direction and landing back on his feet to point a gun at somebody awesome I rewound it and watched it four times. <laughs> There's a story goes that actually Jet Li was mm. such a good fighter, was such was such a talented, skilled, mm. physical performer that they had to tell him to slow down. <laughs> it wasn't being caught on camera very well. Wow. He had to slow down. He was so fucking great. Mm. So the plot is uh, there's actually like a whole bunch of people being um, transported illegally from China mm. uh, to Los Angeles. And uh, some of them are being transported by the triad, uh, represented by Jet Li and a guy named Uncle Benny, um, for reasons that we eventually find out have to do with counterfeiting Chinese currency and also uh, a rant, a bunch of like triad, uh, like bad guys uh, in prison. Yeah, the yeah. bad guys like, in prison. They're, like they're, the, but they're like head triad. They're, guys. they're bribing to get them out of prison. In order to get them out of prison, they need to. A counterfeit counterfeit money, money, and then in order to get one of the counterfeiters to make it, they had to bring his family in from China. Uh, There's a huge shootout on the boat. Riggs, Murtaugh, and Leo just happen to be there when that happens. Well, there's a shark in their boat, which lives forever outside. It's really bizarre. Like, they, we don't see them catch the shark. They've already caught it. They've already come to terms with the fact that they don't know what to do with a shark. So the scene opens with them just sort of looking at a shark on the deck of a boat. And the shark is drowning. It's it's, it's it's in the air. It's It's suffocating. It's just sort of flailing around. It's like, how long does it take for a shark to die? I don't know. This is a weird scene, isn't it? <laughs> and then, of course, when and then, the boat and then, sinks, the shark is free, and then well, they're being attacked by the shark. The and- boat sinks, bringing the arc of the boat to a close. Because in the first movie, it was in a driveway. Oh, yeah. Third movie, it was in the water, and now it's at the bottom of the ocean. I hadn't thought of it before. That is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that is beautiful with that. And uh, then a Chinese boat appre- approaches within 12 minutes of the movie. Riggs has murdered five people already. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we find out uh, th- there's... <sighs> They try to just shoehorn subplots into this. There's a mm-hmm. lot going on. So let's 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 run them down. Uh, Riggs and uh, Renee Russo's character Lorna, mm-hmm. I think her name is. Uh, she's pregnant. She's now nine months pregnant. But they're not yet married. They're not yet married. She's still on the job. She's still in internal affairs, and she's been hired to investigate Murtaugh, who has way more money than anyone thinks he should on a cop's salary. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, uh, they're not sure if they want to get married. Yeah. Like, uh, which makes sense for him because his last wife died and yes. the last they don't really, girlfriend It's interesting killed. that they don't really address specifically that he doesn't want to get married because his last wife died until, until the near end. Until the very end of the movie. If they yeah. mentioned it at the beginning, it actually would have really gone a long way to making it a lot more, you know, dramatically mm-hmm. satisfying. As it stands, I'm like, I thought you got over that in Lethal Weapon 2. Yeah, like well, when uh, you murdered all those guys. Didn't that help? Yeah. No? Wasn't that a thing? <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's going on. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Murtaugh, again, he's flush with cash, and we don't know why. And it's really not important, mm-hmm. and it's so unimportant and, oh, that they and, resolve it in the middle of a shootout while they're talking about other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the idea is that his wife is actually a secretly a romance novelist who's very successful. Mm-hmm. They only mention romance novels in one scene briefly. It's not like there are like posters and billboards mm-hmm. across Los Angeles about how famous this is, like the new J.K. Rowling of romance novels. Like, no. It's really badly done. It adds nothing to the film, and it goes nowhere. And plus, Murtaugh already has a subplot in that, well, kind of, well, in that he has to work with this new hotshot cop played by Chris Rock. Yes. And Chris Rock is the one who is secretly married to his secretly, well, not secretly anymore, but impregnated daughter. Yeah. But he doesn't know, 
he knows that his daughter is pregnant, but he doesn't know who the father is, mm-hmm. and he doesn't know that she's married, and does, and he certainly doesn't know that this is the guy. And she doesn't, and he doesn't like the fact that she'd be married to a cop. A cop. So yeah. they've been keeping it a secret. Also, Murtaugh thinks, thinks that Chris Rock is gay and in love with him. And so every time he brings up like kind of this awkward relationship that they have, he, uh, Chris Rock thinks that he's moving in to introducing himself as yeah. his son-in-law, trying to bond with this older yeah. man. And Murtaugh thinks he's coming on to him. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, so great, we have gay panic. Which is a great thing to add. and But what's weird about this is that when they originally started making the movie, Chris Rock's character wasn't in it. Then they added Chris. So you notice Chris Rock's character contributes nothing. He says no, funny things. He says funny, he's a funny actor. He's yeah. a likable actor. That, that's fine. He contributes nothing to the plot. He's yeah. always just there. And then, <laughs> and then when they originally brought him onto the film, the idea was mm-hmm. his whole subplot is he's the new hotshot guy and he's gay and that makes Murtaugh uncomfortable. And then they decided, no, wait, he's the father of Murtaugh's grandchild. So half the se- his scenes were like, gotcha going to be he was actually gay. <laughs> It's a uh, mess! Uh, 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 isn't that funny? And then meanwhile, uh, we also and have... And Murtaugh even has really offensive dialogue. It's oh, like, yeah. where he's like, he's about to say, I'm your son-in-law, but he thinks that he's going to say, I'm in love with you. Yeah, and, and Murtaugh so, says... So it's like, like hey, look, I know, I know what you're going to say. You really? You know? Yeah, I know you're going to say you're going to gay, that you're going to say you're gay. You're, you're going to gay. You're going to say you're gay, and you're going to say you're in love with me. And I, I just don't bring it up around me. I don't, yeah. I'm not well, he comfortable says, he with saying you, you can do whatever makes you happy. I don't have to like it, is what he says, which That's is right. a really That's ugly right. thing to say. Mm. And and Mel Gibson well, knows what's really going on, and he's laughing. Like, it's really ugly. There's also a lot of racist jokes about Chinese people told by the protagonists yeah. of the film. There, this is one of the most overtly racist Movies well, I've, of its kind. I've seen. Look, I, I've you know, seen the Police Academy movies. I know how much racism there was I toward mean, Asian films in American is, films. But my point uh, is, this is in the late nineties. This is one of the this last. Is, yeah, like, I was about to say this was overtly racist. Ninety-eight. This movie came out, and there's still like an English joke. It's like, no, yeah. that is not cool. It's guys. not. It was that never just, cool, but like now, it's just like you, you, yeah. you read the room. Well, like it. Uh, Mel Gibson sits down and says, he actually, I hadn't, I hadn't heard this joke since the 50s, but he says, fried lice, which is awful. Yeah. Uh, and and then the Chinese guy looks him right in the eye and says, it's fried rice, you prick. Yeah. <laughs> like, he actually calls him out on it, but he's not punished for it. No, he's not. He's and not shamed for making the racist joke. I was watching this and I realized there's a there's a, a, a trend we've noticed. We have another podcast called Cancel Too Soon. Mm-hmm. We review TV shows that lasted one season or less. And a lot of the shows that we've ended up reviewing on that are adventure shows. Oh, where a lot of a, action. Yeah, it's kind of like Lethal Action West. serials. It's kinda like the web and you get a couple of fun characters and every week they go on another adventure and one of the tropes that ends up in a lot of those shows is the Chinatown episode uh, there's a lot of shows with a Chinatown episode. they go to Chinatown there's something to do with a triad or from, some from, old kung fu bad brim, guy from or, brimstone to manimal they're just yeah. everywhere and the thing with this you know the, the, the upside is that it gets a lot of uh, Chinese and, and other Asian actors work mm. That's that is a good thing but the episodes are almost always but, simplistic and insulting. And yeah, kind of this weird, incorrect version of Asian mysticism that hangs over. Yeah, to like, make oh, it, aren't, aren't Asian... And the, what, the, word, the word that's constantly brought up is exotic. Aren't, isn't the Far East exotic? Yeah, and it's, it's like, just, it's just their society, you're, dude. You're, 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 you're really being You're the weird. outsider here. Yeah, you're really being weird about mm-hmm. how you're portraying this other culture. The other thing I think is, is worth noting is that, you know, nowadays, China is this huge market for cinema. Mm-hmm. And we actually go out of our way to make a lot of our bigger blockbuster films really uh, in Enticing to mm. people in China by in casting the, like big Chinese actors, for instance, or setting yeah. scenes in Hong Kong. Yeah, exactly. It's like Shameless in uh, uh, Transformers Four, um, Age of Extinction. Yeah, just, where there's this gigantic action sequence that's in Hong Kong for no reason they whatsoever. They don't need to go there. It's, it's but whatever. I, I, that's relatively harmless. But in the late '90s, mm-hmm. there were a lot of Hollywood films, major Hollywood films, that were treating China as like the new Soviet Union uh, after the Cold War ended. And those we films longer, couldn't be shown in China yet. I, that's, exactly. Yeah. There were uh, after the Cold War, the go-to bad guy for contemporary action movies mm-hmm. could no longer be Russians. They or, changed. Or th- there's a like a whole slew of films about how uh, ex-Soviet stuff still right. needs to be dealt with. And so, it feels yeah. like Ch- uh, Hollywood is trying to find like a new kind of scapegoat. And mm-hmm. China has you know a, a, a government which has some problems. And yeah. so you had a lot of films like Red Corner. Or, or yeah. yeah, and so this Which was... I think it was the same year as Lethal Weapon 4. That was, that was, was like around, 90s. Yeah. Like, there was a lot of... There was actually a lot of filmmakers and actors who, because they were in those movies, aren't allowed into China. <laughs> because they made the Chinese government look really bad. Um, and this is, like, really just kind of, like, kind of... 
kind of unfair, actually, to a yeah, lot of Chinese yeah. people. Um, there's a whole speech some random cop says where, like, you know, when they're got all these Chinese immigrants, illegal immigrants, but they're they're mm. immigrants, they're human beings. And Murtaugh says, whatever happened to give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, you don't need to be free. Yeah. And the guy says, now it says no vacancies. That cop played by Richard Rill. Yeah. Who, who was the, the hop to it Matt guy from Office Space. Yeah. I, I love Richard Rill. Great, I see, great I see yeah, he's a great character actor. I yeah, see and him it's, a lot. And it's a really telling moment. And Murtaugh actually has a bit, because Murtaugh is very politically minded. Mm-hmm. Even if you just look at, like. As we the, learned from the apartheid story. Well, even before that, that you look at the yeah. first uh, the first film, he's got, like, political posters and bumper stickers, like, all over his, like, refrigerator. Mm-hmm. And. So when he, he, there's actually some illegal immigrants who are missed in that sweep, and he takes them into his house. Mm-hmm. A whole and, family. Yeah, and it turns out that, of course, is the family of the counterfeiter, like the only family mm-hmm. that they cared about. So, of course, they come in and they hold the entire family at gunpoint. And Rene Russo has a pregnancy fight, <laughs> which I got to tell you is fucking, watch this with my wife, and we're just like, I've never seen that. That's uh, not how, a thing. How, how would a women fun, don't get to kick ass. <laughs> like they, well, they should. It's really cool. She's in the ninth month. You know, it's still, uh, look, <laughs> like, still badass. I, I, I've lived with somebody who is nine months pregnant. Badass, not doing backflips. That's what I'm saying. She didn't do backflips. She did no, some well, kicks. I guess not. Some like, kicks. It's still badass. It's and I like that Renee Russo because my problem is. I think she should have been like the third lead in this, and she really gets sidelined. Mm. Renee Russo is a great actor. She's a really fun performer. Mm. She doesn't get like seriously complicated roles, but whenever she does, mm. she's amazing. I think she got screwed out of an Oscar nomination for Nightcrawler. Mm. I think she's incredible in Nightcrawler. Yeah, that's, she's, that, she's, that's a fair statement. She's one of my favorite movie stars. She's really cool. Mm. Uh, and I wish she I had know. more to do in this movie. Mm. Uh, Buddy was kind of a misstep. but well, everyone gets one. <laughs> Everyone gets uh, one ape movie they wish they hadn't made. Ah, uh, wish I hadn't made that ape movie. Charlie Theron, where are you? <laughs> uh, I made one too. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson's one now. Yep. Everybody, everyone has the dark ape movie in their past. <laughs> you don't know, man. You weren't there. Anyway, it all leads to a big shootout. Uh, and they fight Jet Li. And the most implausible thing in any of the Lethal Weapon movies is that Mel Gibson and Danny Glover together mm. are able to defeat Jet Li in a fight. Mm. I don't fucking buy it. If you had an army of 100 Mel Gibson clones, I'd buy that. I would think it would be, it'd be a it'd good be a fight. Little, little overwhelmed. It'd be a good fight. I think they might wear him down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, they get down to, like, the last five Mel Gibsons, and yeah, he's like, like, oh, I'm a little tired Yeah, now. Like, the, like, the last four would be able to take him, but that's it. <laughs> the last four Mel Gibsons. <laughs> Uh, and then at the very end, you know, there's big revelations. Uh, there's the scene I remember the most from the theater, strangely enough, was none of the action or the plot, but the scene in the hospital where they have to get married in a hurry. Oh, there's actually, a, yeah, that's actually a And, and this actually really made me, well, first of all, the, the crime stories come to an end. Mel Gibson visits his wife's grave and we mm-hmm. realize that he's been reluctant to get married because he has a dead wife and mm-hmm. it's kind of bringing this all back. So he's like... I need your permission. You know, like he's going to her grace and it's like, can can I do this? Can like, I get is, married? Is it okay? Again? Is it okay for me to get over you? And Leo shows and Leo up. shows up and gives this truly stupid monologue about a pet frog he used to have and how that yeah. was his best friend and how now you're my best friend. Yeah, and, and you Mel didn't Gibson says it was different. Yeah, and, and Mel Gibson says, but we're not your friends. We hate you. We're we're horrible to you all. We we had a dentist torture you for no reason. Yeah, when in you this were, same movie when you were shot in Lethal Weapon Three, we added to like your your file at the police. At the, at the at the hospital, that you should have a rectal exam. We're monsters. Yeah, we we have do nothing but abuse you. Yeah. but you're my best friends. That's really sad. Leo gets. Yeah, but <laughs> his whole his, his whole point is, you're, she, Ray Russo isn't replacing your wife. No. She's a new person in your life. Yeah, and that yeah. is something the Lethal Weapon movies are all about. There's always about new people entering this sort of family yeah, that's, that's dynamic a good point. that they the, got. The, fa- the family keeps yeah. conti- continuing yeah. to grow. So they're at the hospital. They want to get married before she gives birth, and she's just about to. But give she's birth. bearing down. Yeah. yeah, and so the only like sort of official they can find, the, 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 guy, the only cl- member of the clergy they can find, is, is a, a local a is nearby a, rabbi. Yeah, who like he's just sort of he's actually about to do like the the Jewish service. Yeah, and so he's like, what, what, what am I talking about? Uh, what do they do? Uh, do? Do you have an Hold the yada yada etc. Uh, she's like, I do. Do you, for better or worse, etc. I, I do. Okay, kiss the bride. Uh, You're already wait, kissing, and wait, I'm out. Wait a minute. We have a rabbi. Wait, there's one more thing we need to do. And Joe Pesci runs over to this old man who's carrying a vial of urine, and he <laughs> grabs the urine out of his hand and dumps it. And it's like, I need this. I need this. Like, I took me all day to fill that. Wait a minute. And he, he brings it over to Mel Gibson. Okay, you got to step on it. Yeah, step on the glass like at a Jewish this wedding. Is, this is a scene from Father of the Bride. Yeah, they this they, is they not step on the weapon. urine cup, and everybody says Mazel Tov. It's pretty hilarious. Renee Russo is really, really good in that sequence. Mm. There's a bit where before they get there, where mm. she's just like, you know, 
going into labor. It's an intense moment. And she writes, I won't do it. I'm not going to go until he gets here. And then she grabs an older woman's IV and drags it. Give me that. <laughs> I need this. <laughs> Whatever it is. I know. It turns out, much like Father of the Bride 2, she gives birth right when Murtaugh's daughter gives birth. Mm-hmm. And they all the, the babies with, are held together in the ice. There's a big mm-hmm. photograph. Everyone pauses for a photograph. And then the credits show not just shots from the movie, but a photo album of making the movies of, while Why Can't We Be Friends uh, is playing. And what's really funny is that the last, kind of the last line is saying, we're not friends, we're family. Mm. And then they ask, why can't we be friends? Because we're family, <laughs> Lethal Weapon. You literally <laughs> just answered the question. Um, something I really love, uh, they show the, uh, an album of the making of the movie and it actually shows, I think, almost every single member of the crew. Yeah, like a lot of members uh, of the crew every, are in there, Everybody yeah. gets a photograph. Like, not like the photographers and the grips and everybody. Like, as the credits roll, we see photos of all these people. Watching the credits gave me such horrid flashbacks because I worked in a movie theater that was showing Lethal Weapon 4 <laughs> in the summer of 1998, and I heard Why Can't We Be Friends to the, that very same yeah. sequence about 50 times. Yeah, if, you're not, if you never worked in a movie theater, uh, you, one of the big jobs you have to do is you have to clean the theater right afterwards, mm. and so you're always just waiting there because you know when the movie lets out. Mm. So you're always just waiting there as the credits you're, start, and you fact, hear the credits music a million times. In our theater, we had to stand there by the door to hold it open for the people exiting to make yeah. it seem sort of professional. It was just guys, guys with a broom standing next to a door. There was nothing <laughs> professional about it. But yeah. So yeah, I'm waiting for Lethal Weapon 4 to get out 50 times. We have six theaters. I'm hearing it five, six, 12 times a day <laughs> for the entire run of Lethal Weapon 4. Yep. I came to hate that song. I'm <laughs> sure you did. <laughs> uh, overall, um, what are your thoughts on the Lethal Weapon franchise? I, kind of, I like. I really like the first one, but the other ones just don't really do it for me. Yeah. Um, I understand the second one is really slick, and I think if I had seen it in like the late '80s when it first came out, I probably would have been a lot more on its wavelength. It's a very entertaining it fe- movie. It feels the whole series as a whole though it feels really dated. Oh yeah. Like a lot of its sensibility, a lot of its plot setup. It's not just an old premise, the Buddy Cop movie. The actual attitude of it, the wisecrackingness of it, the way the plot moves, the way the action films are shot. The way it doesn't treat police work seriously. Yeah, it all feels like something that is uh, almost very distant to what we're dealing with today. Yeah, it's very retro. And there's there's a way to do retro. You look at something like The Nice Guys, which is a retro kind of movie that Shane Black made. Yeah. Almost an homage to his own work in, in Lethal Weapon. And that one feels like a new take on fresh material. Plus, it's very noirish. It actually mm-hmm. is of a different genre. Um, this doesn't feel like something that can that is eternally fresh. And watching Lethal Weapon 2, I didn't really feel like I was thrilled again. I felt like something that this chapter was already over. And I, w- I was revisiting something that was kind of already rehashed to death and no longer has the life that it once could sustain. You know, Lethal Weapon, the first Lethal Weapon, I mm. think uh, people give a lot of Shane Black a lot of credit for it, and they should. It changed a lot. Mm. But one of the things that Shane Black initially was really, really great at was combining genres without really calling a lot of attention to it. Yeah. The first Lethal Weapon has a lot in there. It's a buddy cop movie. Yes. Mm. It's also a Vietnam War post-traumatic stress movie. Right. It's also a movie about suicide. Mm. It's also a movie about family life. Mm. It's also uh, a movie that has a lot of film noir elements. There's a lot to it. It works on a variety of different levels, and they're all kind of jumbled together, and he finds this kind of common ground between all of these disparate elements. Mm. We kind of lose that very quickly. Mm. Yeah, well, two has bits of it. I think mm. two because Riggs is still a mess. We still have that element, that element of like underlying seriousness, mm. where it still mostly works. I think it's a very satisfying mm. film Two. generally. And then af- by that point, by three, it's just a dumb buddy cop movie. Mm. It's they're well, it, it, they're it slick. Turned, it turned into something that would be ripping it off rather than exactly. the thing that's sort like, of p- pushing the boat forward. Lethal Weapon more. Three is perfectly slick. It's a, it's an okay watch. Mm mostly forgettable except yeah. for Rene Russo I think and then 4 is a fucking mess it's weirdly racist and has a lot of like and, and, and gay panic and humor weirdly, and like, it, it, it was also the one that had the most moments that made me laugh out loud if there's some funny most, bits mostly because of Chris Rock frankly yeah but I loved his lines like, you, you see a black man in the back of a car and automatically I'm a perp? Look at my suit, man. Look at my tie. What am I, a Crips accountant? <laughs> I like that line. It's a hell of a line. Like, yeah, but he's wasted, though. Yeah. Like, it's all of this jumble of stuff. Like, everyone involved is too good at what they do. They're too amiable. Mm. Uh, the writing is too full of, like, okay jokes a lot of the time. The action is still really cool. Like, I want people, like, if... if 
besides the fact that Lethal Weapon 1 is a badass, and I think Lethal Weapon 2 is pretty badass as well, Mm -hmm. if I could sort of get contemporary audiences, uh, contemporary filmmakers to look back at the Lethal Weapon movies, I would say look at two things. Mm -hmm. One, look at how earnest and emotional Lethal Weapon 1 is. Mm -hmm. And two, look at how wonderfully well filmed yeah, they yeah, are. It they is are clear. Amazingly they are exciting. Filmed. Yeah, they are just really without calling attention. Like people think, like if you're not like super fucking flashy mm-hmm. about your cinematography, that it's like not flashy. Like, this is it's total. Like the first two, totally real, mm-hmm. totally you are their cinematography until it needs to be amazing, and then it looks amazing. <laughs> it's really well handled. Uh, so yeah, overall series gets progressively worse. It's just one of those. Each one is yeah. worse than the one that preceded it. Never gets unwatchable. Well, the four kind of sucks. It's just you know. Well, I, three is just forgettable, and four, yeah, is like good bits and bad bits that average yeah. it out. Unfortunately, and yeah. If you're already on board, you're probably going to want to mm-hmm. see it because Jet Li is a great bad guy. Mm-hmm. Some of the action's kind of amazing. Some of the jokes are funny, but yeah, it's just this, just this tidal wave of stuff. <laughs> it doesn't really function. Feels like one of the less graceful James Bond movies. Yeah. Wait, wait. Why are we in the Ukraine again? Ah, it doesn't even matter. We'll just anymore. have a motorcycle chase. Who knows? Um, so that's uh, that's the Lethal Weapon movies, and that's critically acclaimed. That is critically week. acclaimed for this week. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a couple of uh, emails we can uh, yeah, we okay. can read. Um, but uh, next month, at the end of February, mm-hmm. y'all voted. And we're going to review all of the Herbie the Love Bug movies. <laughs> you chose well. Mm. That will be really fun. Because we're not only just going to do the original Herbie the Love Bug movies, we're going to do the made-for-TV movie with Bruce Campbell. From 97? Yeah. I the, have one that that one. In, the one that introduces Herbie's arch nemesis, Horace the Hate Bug. Yep. And we're going to be doing the Herbie movie with Lindsay Lohan. Because obviously... Well, I mean, it's also canonical. It's, it's canon. Yeah. They're all canon. <laughs> it's really cool. That's a really consistent mm. franchise. So well, this will be fun. What I love is the franchise... The franchise lasted so long. A certain, I think the first one was 68, yeah. and the Lindsay Lohan film was 2005, I believe, around there. Yeah, mid-2000s, yeah. And by that point, the Volkswagen Beetle, the Type 1, had gone out of production, and, yeah. they had, and it was out of production for a while, and then they brought it back into production with the new Beetle. Yeah. So we had to introduce Herbie to a new Beetle in, in the 2005 film. <laughs> the joke they use, Herbie, she's too young for you. Oh, I forgot about yeah. that. You're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. weird. Anyway, we got a lot of weird crap to deal with. Some weird shit in those Herbie movies. Mm. Oh man! All right. All right. Uh, so anyway, you can email us critically acclaimed fans at gmail dot com. Uh, we read as many as we can. We mm. uh, have too many to read all of them, but we do our best. So uh, let's see uh, who we got. This uh, is a letter from Adam. Hello, Adam. Hello, uh, Adam. Write, uh, calls this critically acclaimed mailbag number one. So I think he intends to write in some more. Okie dokie. I I welcome it. Uh, I usually write in regards to Cancel Too Soon, our other podcast, but I'm a huge fan of the movie-based podcast as well. I wanted to ask you about your review on a particular aspect of movie criticism. Hmm. We often hear that, quote, all movie is subjective, every opinion counts, everyone is a critic, etc. We say it at the end of this show. We do. Uh, Sure, I do agree that everyone is entitled to his or her opinion, but I strongly disagree that every criticism is right and valid, since there are some objective elements of movie making. For example, you don't find the Three Amigos funny, that's fair. It's a matter of, of your sense of humor. You don't like Let There Be Blood, There Will Be Blood because you think Daniel Day-Lewis is a horrible actor. Sorry, but this means that you don't know a thing about acting, hence your criticism is not valid. Hmm. I'm not saying that everyone should love Citizen Kane or hate Adam Sandler movies. Well, maybe you should. <laughs> Liking is subjective. What I'm saying is that if you publicly claim that Sandler is a much better movie maker than Orson Welles, you should probably keep this opinion to yourself. I respect you guys a lot a lot when you say that you appreciate a movie even if you didn't like it. Sorry for ranting. Sometimes I get really tired of this notion that an expertise expertise is only a matter of opinion, not competence. Okay, there's a, there's a difference between an opinion and a critique. Uh-huh. You can have an opinion on something without knowing anything about it. Mm. You can. You can just listen to a song, you know nothing about music, you decide if you like it or not. Mm. Boom. A critique needs to have something behind it. You need to be able to say, I felt this way about this movie. Because. Because. Yeah. And you need to know enough about the subject that what you have observed mm. can be, other people can see it too, mm. once you describe it. That's the difference between everyone has an opinion and everyone uh, is, is, a critic. is a critic. Yeah. I, I realize we're somewhat, I, uh, maybe that's undermining our, our closer, but I honestly think that most people... If they love movies enough to listen to a movie-centric podcast, where we've been doing this for over two hours now, have probably seen enough movies that they're probably pretty well read. 
Mm. Like if you think about how many well, movies well watched as it were. Well, I mean, if you think about like how many movies a typical person has seen by the time they're let's say twenty, mm. um, unless their parents are really good at keeping them away from multimedia, mm. which a lot of some parents are, and that's their choice. Mm. Um, most people have seen hundreds and not thousands of movies. If you had, if you read thousands of books. You would be very well read. You, you would have your opinion about books would mean something. You, you know, you would think that in watching a, a friend of, when I was first starting in the crit game, as it were, mm-hmm. uh, a friend of mine asked, "Well, what? I, I have an opinion too. You have an opinion, but yet you're you call yourself a critic. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? You know, what what? Why is a critic's opinion more valid?" And I said, "Well, it's not a matter of the critic's opinion being more valid than yours. It's yeah. not about trying to temper your enjoyment of a thing. It's about." Trying to figure out why something works, mm-hmm. and, and the if only you have thing more you can, expertise, the only you thing you can, can say that. for sure about a critic is not that they, they necessarily know more than you, or that they're better at liking movies than you. It's just that just that they've seen more than you. They should have seen more than you. If, if, you're, if, if a film critic has seen fewer movies than you, don't listen to that critic. No, if, if they're good critics, or even if they're just starting, they're going to be consuming voraciously, and from that habit, you can glean that they have at least absorbed kind of the way the language works, the way cinema functions. And as such, they are are able to, with more expertise, comment on why something is functioning the way it is. There's there's still this tendency. I think we're long past the point where people say that films aren't art. That Mm. used to be an argument Mm. that that really uptight people would say sometimes. And and many films aren't, I would would argue. uh, Certainly not high art, but Mm. like, I think we're past that. But there's still this mentality... And we get a lot when critics like deride a popular blockbuster. Mm. Uh, why can't you just turn your brain off? First off, I don't, my, don't brag about turning off your brain. If I'm turning my brain off, it means I'm in a coma. So no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't have to turn your brain off to enjoy something. I can enjoy dumb and or bad things mm. while my brain is on. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't have to do that. A critic is close reading something, and yeah. they always close read something. You, I can, I when I like when I listen to music, I don't have to pay super close attention to it. I'm doing it very passively. A lot of people consume media very passively. Mm. Critics are active readers of an art form even if it's not film mm. they they really think about every single thing that goes into it it's really important to them um it's like um when you're in high school you're you're taught reading comprehension you're not mm. just reading the book and deciding if you like it they're making sure you understand are you getting the subtext mm. are you picking up on the themes what is the author actually trying to say we don't necessarily do that with a lot of other media we, we do it like film, but it's only in like really specialized schools. Yeah, I think it's yeah. starting to get a little bit more common, but like still, for the most part, you're not being taught how filmmaking works or how even or even other forms of media. Like there should be, you know, people should be taught at a young age how to consume the news. Yeah, for like, sure. It's not just like just accept everything they tell you. No, think about where it's coming from. What is mm. the agenda? What is being said? What is not being said? Whose perspective is being left out? Critics are or should be looking at a movie and thinking about every different individual aspect. Some will be more important than others. Some will be relatively straightforward. Mm. When it comes down to just, is Daniel Day-Lewis a good actor? I don't think that is objective. I think you can look at his performances and say, I don't like what he's doing. As long as you can explain why that is, that is valid. If you're saying, like, sort of a blanket statement, Daniel Day-Lewis is a bad actor, uh... I would argue that he is not. We can have have a debate about that. I've seen his body of work, and we can have a debate about that. If you say his performance in There Will Be Blood is a bad performance, that can be backed up. You can say that. In fact, I've even heard people say it, because he... It's like Bill the Butcher. You know, he's a very good actor. He can do these very calm, very naturalist things, very subtle things. Mm. Watch Lincoln, for God's sake. That's his best performance. Uh, Arguably, yeah. But, um... The, those characters he did, Bill the Butcher and um, Daniel, Daniel Plainview, Plainview, were such caricatures. They were such cartoons. He was mm. overplaying it so much. That's the argument that can be the, made. This, yeah, this, I, this, I don't this, actually subscribe to that, but I've This heard is that. the argument yeah. I heard. I agree with it with Bill the Butcher, not so much with Daniel Plainview, because I think that's the point of Daniel Plainview, is yeah. that he doesn't know how to behave like a human. I think that's Bill the Butcher as well. I think yeah. he's putting on pomp and circumstance. Yeah. Look at the size of his hat, for God's sake. But yeah. <laughs> that whole movie's a mess. Anyway, yeah, Gangs of New York is such a, it's such a clusterfuck. But but uh, I can see why so many, and I heard why so many people were turned off by his performance in There Will Be Blood, and I'm willing to hear that. Mm-hmm. And when I hear that, as a critic, I get to listen to those opinions and consider them. So I can look at that performance again and 
sort of either hone in on whether or not I agree or disagree with that, or maybe have my mind changed. Yeah. I think by saying, since I disagree with you, your opinion is invalid, is a dangerous uh, yeah. ar- argumentative trap you can fall into. Well, the other thing I will say is that I think there's between saying something is good and bad, because mm-hmm. that's just whether or not you like it or approve of it, or whether it's a style that you dig. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you can say is competent or incompetent. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of filmmaking does boil down to a lot of technical craft. It's very rare Mm. to see a motion picture that gets released in any meaningful way Mm. that has unlistenable sound. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You would know. You can't turn that off. You will Mm. hear that the sound is bad. You will hear that the, you will see that the lip sync is completely off. Mm. It's very rare that that happens. But if it was, you would have to say, well, unless this is some really weird artistic choice, which they better (laughs) address in the narrative, then this is clearly not competent technical Mm. craftsmanship. Like, so that might be a case. But when it comes down to I like the performance, I didn't like the performance, that, mm. that is taste. Now, people can largely agree on what they, mm. you know, most people seem Ooh, to agree you know blank. What? But even that can change over time. And, people, and this, a performance that is celebrated now, 50 years from now, will mm. be considered hammy. The, this, this brings up an important point that I've actually written about before. Mm. Uh, how, <clears throat> thanks to the way movie criticism moves online... Yeah, and how everybody can sort of insert their own opinion, and now we have so many reviews. We need review aggregators like Metacritic scores and Rotten Tomatoes scores. Sure, that it is actually giving a lot of defenders and lambasters of films a kind of truth about a film that can now be validated or invalidated. Yeah, I, it's like, I'm I, looking for my opinion to be validated. Look at the Rotten Tomatoes score. Yeah, validated. It's like, it's like, hey, like if I were to write a really impassionate defense of M. Night Shyamalan's After Earth, just to cite mm-hmm. an example, um, <clears throat> I actually think there's some interesting things in After Earth. It's not a good film, hmm. but I'm, I'm, I'm willing it, to have yeah. a conversation about a the, the, the things I think it did right and the things I think it did wrong. But if you look at Rotten Tomatoes and it has like maybe a 10% approval rating... A lot of people who disliked the film are going to point to that as proof that it is bad. Mm-hmm. They're not going to. They to want to turn engage. it into math. The, they're, they're the turning box it into office math. can be the yeah. same thing. Oh, it wasn't successful at the box office, therefore it's bad. Or it mm. was successful at the box office, therefore it's good. That's the t- more usually more of a testament to marketing, mm. unless it really has legs. It looks like Wonder Woman, where it was it had a pretty big opening weekend, but then it stayed big. Yeah, for like a and, long time. That is well, that I, actually indicates that people liked it enough that they told other people or they saw it more than once. And a lot of big hits we're still waiting on. Like, yeah. what, are we still going to be talking about Wonder Woman in the same terms in 15 years? We mm. shall see. Yeah, time is the only film critic that mm. matters because it decides <laughs> the movies that stick so, with us and influence us and we keep referencing and we keep fresh and part of our lives. Cr- criticism is about an ongoing conversation. It's not about being right or being wrong. It's not about proving arguments. And it's n- definitely not being about on the right side of history or making sure that your taste allies with popular opinion it's none of those things Mm -hmm. it is just about making sure you can be clear about how film functions what you think a film is trying to do and how you think it contributes to the conversation at large as cinema as a whole moves forward well i think the great films are going to be moving cinema in some interesting ways yeah and sometimes unexpected ways a movie that we think of as just a movie that's Mm. okay in 10 years might actually turn out to be really important Mm. and you know that's i said Time dictates these things. Um, the other, th- just to add an addendum, I think there's also this philosophy that critics have to be wholly objective. This is literally impossible. <laughs> a critic's job is not to be objective mm. because you have things you like, mm-hmm. things you don't like. And you're just going to come in liking those things or not liking those things. And then the a goal, a critic needs to be honest about their opinions. Yeah. yeah, I like this for these reasons. And you can say, I like, listen, I, I, I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm a big fan of, I don't know, westerns or whatever mm-hmm. genre it is. So when I saw Hostels, I came in from that perspective and I liked it or disliked it for these reasons. That is honesty. Uh-huh. You can't you can't just say, if, if you know, I don't like Hostels because uh, Christian Bale was mean to me in elementary school when we were in school together. That's bias. <laughs> that's a different thing. <laughs> this is just, oh, I like this, I like this genre. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not bias. It's not... I don't uh, particularly like the other films in this franchise. That's not bias. You've just been watching the films. It's 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 a, a type of bias, but it's not the type that undoes criticism. No, you just need to be honest about it. If you can't be honest about it, that undoes your criticism. Mm-hmm. And if you and if this doesn't match up with your audience's experience, then they know that going in, mm-hmm. and they can make informed decisions about their art, what art they're going to consume or look after, because this person who believes this thing or likes this thing likes or didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You yeah. don't have to agree with a critic for them to be a critic whose <laughs> opinion is useful to you. Is yeah, my point. Yeah. Um, 
another letter. Let's do it. Sorry, that got off on a long one. Oh, it's fine. It's it's important. It goes to our craft. Anyway, All this right. one comes from Hayden. Okay. Hello. It's that time of year <clears throat> where one critically acclaimed film gets giant backlash. <laughs> this year, it's three billboards. Mm. Last year, it was La La Land. Somehow, it's always movies I personally love. Mm. This brings me to my question of, or questions. What are some films that got massive backlash that you still love? What were some movie backlashes that you felt were unearned? Mm. Why do you think backlash happens towards films with massive critical acclaim? On a personal note, I find it a tad bit funny that Three Billboards, a movie about how anger can destroy us and makes us do bad things, is getting so much anger-fueled hatred thrown at it. I understand there are legit problems with the film, but I personally find that interesting. Um, There are legit problems with the film. I think it goes even beyond that, but fair enough. Backlash functions in a strange way. Uh, It's usually overcorrection. You find a... Yeah. Like... Like uh, just earlier in this podcast, I was talking about how Shape of Water is a little overrated. And I think the temptation for someone who feels like a film that's getting a lot of critical acclaim doesn't deserve quite that much acclaim tries to overcorrect. Yeah. And they try to start saying, oh, here are a lot of problems we're, with We're this. trying to average it out, mm. basically. This is natural inclination. It's like when I used to, when I first had Netflix mm. and you would like give a star rating back when the star ratings dictated like, you know, your recommendations or whatever, uh-huh. I would go through it. And what I did, and I totally screwed it up because this isn't how their algorithm worked, was I would see a film that got like, oh, everyone else says this is a five. Mm. Well, I thought it was a three, Mm -hmm. but if I give it a three, it won't change the ratings. I'll give it a one, Uh and that'll bring it back down to where I think it should be. I was trying to get in the system. I didn't understand how it worked. It was stupid. I give give everything on Netflix one star just to see what happens. (laughs) One of the big examples I remember from the 90s was Titanic. Yeah. Titanic is a film. I remember seeing Titanic. I saw Titanic opening weekend. You got to remember, Titanic's opening weekend was not that big. It was not a huge opening weekend. It was just a. It did it just, okay. It just everyone, played for months. Everyone expected like, oh, if this plays like every other movie, it'll disappear in a month and it'll lose a ton of money. And then it just it made the same amount of money every weekend for like three months, and it was insane. <laughs> um, but I saw Titanic and I thought to myself, this movie has problems. It's okay. Mm. I think uh, uh, um, I'm glad I saw it. Um, it's not my favorite James Cameron movie. And we're going to move on. And then people kept talking about it. And it swept the Oscars. And it was a huge fucking deal. And I, in my youthful, uh, overcorrecting exuberance, started being really anti-Titanic. Well, yeah. it's not that good. Therefore, it's well, bad. Also, when I'm only going to focus on the bad. When it's not just critically acclaimed, but it sort of leaks into the culture the way Titanic did. Oh, you yeah. could hear My Heart Will Go On was playing in department people stores. People quoting it everywhere. They're, they're, like they're, they're spoofing it on South Park, for God's sake. Still and, to this day, people spoof it. It's yeah, like and that kind of so cultural penetration. Because, we don't see it because it penetrated so deeply it was really really easy to take out that sort of punk rock attitude and say well no that, that's not a good movie in fact that's one of the worst I've ever seen what uh-huh. do you think of that yeah kind then, of defiantly like throwing snot on the man and I was kind of and it, and it like and there was this perception that like you know it, other movies were getting glossed over like LA Confidential maybe should have won Best Picture that year mm-hmm. that kind of thing who's to say and who cares honestly now but I cared <laughs> at the time and I rewatched it a few years ago after mm-hmm. a long time like I hadn't seen it since like 2000 yeah. I haven't, like, seen, I haven't seen Titanic for a while. Either. I tell you some. Hmm. Holds it's up. A good movie. It's, it's, it's a well I mean, the dialogue's really clunky a lot of the time, but it's a well told story. It's it, effective. It, it's the the apex of pop filmmaking. Yeah. Something like Titanic. And there's there's a lot of movies that could serve that for as an example. Um the kind of backlash that really gets me is a film that's kinda bad that starts attracting the wolves and people start saying that it's the worst thing ever made. Mm. Um this happened. I remember the whole controversy when uh, Roger Ebert gave a two star review to Gili. Ah. Um, and Gili. Not, because, a good, not a good film. Because it's he didn't, pretty ridiculous. But because he didn't jump on it and say it's the worst thing yeah, ever. Yeah, because he didn't say it was the worst thing ever. He yeah. says there's actually a lot of fascinating stuff in here. It just doesn't work as a drama because there's all these weird decisions that are being made. Yeah. And. and that was not harsh enough. And he actually caught flack for not having a negative enough review. Yeah. So it's still. That's still a thumbs down in the Roger Ebert book. Yeah. But no, it wasn't negative enough. And there are a lot of films out there that aren't great, but I find to be kind of fascinating. They're really interesting. They're not kind of interesting. That I'm, they I'm, do things that are worth that I'd, talking about. I'd like, to, I, I'd like to talk about them as sort of interesting failures, or at the very least, things that tried something new, but... I'm expected to hate them off the bat because they have mm-hmm. such a bad reputation. One of these films is The Happening. I actually think there's a lot of fascinating things going on in The Happening. I think it's a neat idea. I think it's meant to be funny. And uh, and I, I don't, and I don't, don't mind... It, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't work entirely, but I think it works better than people gave it credit for. Okay. People turned it into this, like, n- negative-sum game when really it's just sort of an interesting failure. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there aren't so many films out there that are actually so bad that they can be universally hated in such a fashion mm. that have that reputation. In fact, usually if they're universally hated, it means they're actually really hitting you someplace really hard, and mm. they didn't. Maybe they didn't do something right, but they did something weirdly effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they managed to really well, stick in your craw. Or, bad art, you know, truly bad art, mm. like usually just sort of evaporates. Well, or what's happening, and this is what I'm criticizing, is when people hear that it's hitting other people and they say, "Well, I already kind of had it in." for this filmmaker or this star or this type of movie. Uh So I'm just going to sort of get on and say, oh, absolutely, it's bad. And they go in looking for things to criticize. Are we talking about the Razzies right now? Because that's basically what the Razzies do. That's exactly what the Razzies do. And I hate the Razzies for it. It's only low-hanging fruit. It's only unpopular opinion, as it were. Every once in a while they get it right. But let me tell you something. Like this year, not only... Okay, I still haven't seen Mother. I know I'm behind Mm. on that. But Mother is a film you love. I put it on my top ten. I love Mother. And they nominated Jennifer Lawrence for best... Worst actress, which is insanity, just yeah. because Lo- Mother got an F Cinema score. That's yeah, the only it's, reason. It's, and there's another one on there, hmm. nominated for best actress, Catherine Heigl for the movie um, Unforgettable. Unforgettable. And I'm going to tell you something right now. She gives a great she, performance she actually, in Unforgettable. She gives a very good performance. In that's that like movie. that's that like is, the best performance I've ever seen from Catherine Heigl. She's actually, a great villain. It's a, it's quite a. I'm not going to say it's a great piece it's, of cinema it's or anything, a but it's, it's a nuanced a, a really, performance. Really, a really good sort of exploitation movie. And, yeah, uh, both her and Rosario Dawson, fantastic mm. in that film. That's a good film. It's not amazing, but it's good. So yeah, they're they're all uh, most of the movies you've heard about being one of the worst ever made actually aren't that bad. And I recall when The Visit came out, M Night Shyamalan's <clears throat> The Visit. Oh yeah. The fanboy community had it in for M. Night Was Shyamalan. ready to hate it. Right, because he had made like maybe four movies in a row that all tanked and were not good. And, and, and to varying degrees, they were they were mostly not good. Mostly like, not Like, The Last Airbender sucks. The La- Last Airbender sucks. Um, I'm, ha- I'm not outraged by The Last Airbender, but I'm not going to defend it. It sucks. And yeah. uh, it's just such bad filmmaking. After Earth was a mess. After, after the Earth happening is, was has a been, mess. Uh, the, the Visit the, is not a good film. I think uh, The Visit's okay. Oh, uh, Visit. The Visit. The visit again, good, see, there's, there's this good, thing you can there's say. There's good, creepy stuff in The Visit. Uh, I think the visit Lady in the Water works. is self serving in the most obvi- glaringly obvious po- way possible. Yeah. People hated this guy just because he had a recent bad track he had a stri- record. He had a bad track record for a while. And he made The Visit, and The Visit is good. Uh, yeah. What, you said The Visit wasn't good. You think with The Village? No, The Visit. The but visit you, is good. But when I said the visit, you said the visit was bad. Oh, I thought you were talking about the village. Yeah, okay, I, I was confused because okay. I thought we were we, Mix, you were saying mixed them up in my head. I'm they're sorry. both V movies. The village was the one that was lambasted. The visit is good. Yeah, and even the village has some <clears throat> interesting stuff. In when it. when the visit came out, I remember seeing one of those online cranky YouTube critics uh-huh. uh, taking us through point by point, saying how horrible it was and how stupid the plot points were. And you look at something like that and you see this whole sort of whole phenomenon where people are kind of mining bad movies for comedy. And there's this type of criticism humor out in the world. Yeah. You see this with like Doug Walker and the whole nostalgia critic thing where he just sort of watches a movie and says, that's terrible. That's terrible. Oh, my God, I want to like shave my face off because it's so bad. And their outrage is a source of humor. And they're, and they're doing that with films with... That are good or bad, really. They're just yeah. sort of using it as fodder for their comedy. And I noticed that that is actually sort of shaping the way people are perceiving films. And this guy is going into something like The Visit, looking for... Not Doug Walker, but the person you were... The person I was talking yeah, about. Yeah. Uh, looking for a bit. He's looking for a comedy routine. Whether or not it's there. Whether or not it's there. So he's actually kind of trying to dredge up all of these things about The Visit that aren't really all that bad but he's going to pretend they're bad because he wants to be the outraged critic Mm -hmm. and that's the type of backlash that really kind of hurts me when people really are trying to turn criticism into something that it's not i've seen way too many people Mm -hmm. uh argue that a movie is bad and admit that they haven't seen it you can't do that you i mean these aren't critics if Mm -hmm. they were critics i would like I'm fucking call them out. It's fucked up. But like, uh, no, just people just like, oh, you Jupiter sending. Oh, that's probably terrible. You don't fucking know. Did, nobody saw that movie. Yeah, it's a, it's a damn shame. It's yeah. actually a really interesting film. <laughs> it's got a lot of problems, but I think it's interesting. Um, Do I have to bring up Valerian again? I'm going to forever. Valerian, why? Why Valerian? <laughs> Um, mm. Okay. Um, do we have time? For, let's, no, let's do one more. Letter. One more. Okay. One more. Uh, this one comes from Brooklyn. Hello, Brooklyn. Okay. The, a person named Brooklyn. Not. Not. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this comes from Prince Edward Island. Yeah. This greetings from Prince Edward Island. Love listening to your show. It makes waking up on Monday morning a breeze. My question is: Do you feel some genres or subgenres are on the back burner, and or filmmakers don't have interest in making? The ones that stand out to me are courtroom dramas hmm. or spoof comedies. These genres are homes of two of my favorite films: A Few Good Men and Airplane. Uh, cheers, gentlemen. Keep up the good work. Well, yeah. thank you, Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, these things go in cycles. Um, mm-hmm. It's very rare for a genre to die out entirely. 
It happens. Well, we, we were just talking about how the, the the YA dystopian genre is kind of coming to a close. Well, here's here's uh, uh, the erotic thriller has been on the back burner for a long, That's long true. time. We don't, There's we been don't a see few. the sex thrillers so much. There been a few, I, I guess like, Unforgettable was kind in of, its orbit. I think The Boy quite. Next Door was like the closest, and go. that's a yeah. fun movie. It's it's dumb. It's so stupid that movie, but it's, but it's very entertaining. It's really fun to watch. It's a really entertaining film. Uh, but yeah, spoof movies. You know, there was the airplane mold and the Mel Brooks mold where there was like a lot of thought went into it. And then people realized that you don't have to put any thought into it and yeah, you'd still you still make a certain amount of money if you make it cheap enough. The, the Friedberg Seltzer film. I think yeah. the scary movies kind of knocked that one, yeah. uh, not knocked that into motion. And then like he will just got even lazier from there. Mm. And boy, did that stink. Yeah, we, we the spoof movies are. are straight to video stuff right now it's only a matter of time before someone makes a really good one and it becomes popular again but well, we'll, um, we'll see if if can you do retro spoof is the thing can we'll you bring see. it back we'll see uh, um what was the other example uh, courtroom drama is courtroom drama. i think courtroom drama is one of those uh, uh genres that actually found a bigger home on television you yeah. can see a courtroom drama on tv basically every night if you know where to look <laughs> all the law and orders all the 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 csis I mean, or whatever uh, there's a ton of lawyer shows on all the time. Also, John Grisham can only write so many novels. Let's yeah. be honest here. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. But, but like, courtroom drama has been around for as long as yeah. there been courtrooms. Uh, well, in fact, if if you haven't seen Anatomy of a Murder, the Otto Priminger film with Jimmy Stewart, uh, fifty nine, I think that came out. There you go. That is a great film. Sure. That's that's one of the earlier courtroom dramas I've seen that like feels very modern. Mm-hmm. It's like the the first modern courtroom drama. There's no shortage the of great courtroom dramas. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, romantic comedies. Kind of also segued into like this TV mold. You get a lot of them like the Hallmark Channel or like that. But frankly, they're they're kind of they're not really trying. They're just doing all the tropes most mm. of the time. Occasionally, you see a good one, but yeah. Um, yeah. But like the Big Sick is like the closest we had to into comedy, and actually does hit a lot of the rom com tropes. It's just a ro- well, it's just a straight up romance. It's a romance it with like yeah. this odd thing that happens in the middle, but like yeah, it, but it feels like a romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think romantic comedy is one that I miss a good romantic comedy. There used to be at least a good <laughs> romantic comedy every couple of months, and now mm-hmm. nothing. Yeah, uh, it's a perfectly good genre. It's very funny. Um, what else? Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't see well because of the way the marketplace works. You know, everybody is focused on sort of the the big high money films these days, the big blockbusters. That's where the conversation is. St- yeah, Star Wars. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I came of age during the '90s, during the whole you know Miramax indie boom. So a lot of like smaller aside dramas about like young people in small towns. Yeah, I saw a lot of really great ones of those in the '90s. Dancer Texas, population eighty <laughs> one, something like that. Yeah, Zizix Road. Zizix, no one, you, no like, one, literally no one saw it. Like Zizix Road is like one of the lowest grossing films ever. It's it's <laughs> famous because nobody's seen it, <laughs> um, which is ironic. Yeah, it is ironic. But yeah, uh, I think a lot of those, like that type of playful conversation-based indie drama, mm. you know, you're, you you got your clerks. Uh, you don't see a lot of those mm. anymore. With that, that kind no, I think of you voice. do, but they don't they don't break out. They don't like, break you'll, out. You'll, they're, you'll they're see them like, in, flooding onto Netflix on mass. Yeah, though those sorts of things are now, yeah, like really kind of film schools maybe one theater barely get a release type of thing yeah they, they those don't used, flood the theaters those used too. to be a lot more in the limelight and i miss mm-hmm. that era that's fair anyway we, we need to wrap up because my voice is going <laughs> Poor thing. okay yeah so uh, again you can email us critically acclaimed fans <clears throat> at gmail.com uh and uh we are going to be back next week with a review of winchester and also uh we're gonna have a, a new uh, uh bad movie that we're gonna pair with a good movie <clears throat> or at least an allegedly bad movie mm. and this time we're gonna be focusing all on on sort of bigger, broader sci-fi adventure films. <laughs> we haven't really done one of those yet, and we wanted to get them all out there. Mm. Uh, so, your options are, and you know what? I'm going to be bold. I'm going to add a six option to this. <gasps> oh, you just want to add I, it? I think we need to. All right. So, your well, options are. These, these were all culled from a, a poll, er, an earlier poll. And I'm pretty sure this one's been, been nominated as well, but all I don't right, think okay. we, we mentioned it. So, what okay. are our options? Your options are The Ice Pirates. Yep. Uh, John Carter. The, the rather the, notorious bomb. I think they finally just recouped their losses with the like the tenth <sighs> with the tenth Avengers film. They finally recouped. All right, uh, Jupiter ascending, mm-hmm. uh, another notorious bomb. Plan Nine from outer space, going back a bit. Ah, uh, you know that one. Heck, I know that one. <laughs> Wing Commander, and or, and again, this is about being a notorious bomb. Not necessarily, we're always going to agree that it's bad. Mm-hmm. Valerian in the city of a thousand planets. Hell yeah. 
so that's put, another option. Put that you got there. on there. If, if we have Jupiter Ascending on there, we got to pair it with Valerian. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, but Valerian is the allegedly it, bad like film. Add, add it. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. We will review one of those next week based on whatever wins the Patreon poll on the Schmoville exclamation point Facebook page. Uh, the poll should be up right now as soon as uh, this episode goes live on the uh, Schmoes No iTunes feed, which has a bunch of other great podcasts. Check it out. It's also on. Uh, YouTube on SK+. Mm. Uh, you can also check out our other podcast, Cancelled Too Soon. Every week we review a new television series, or an old television series, uh, yeah. that was cancelled after only one season or less. Mm. Uh, this week, we are reviewing... Winning? Oh, uh, we are reviewing... Well, we got the Dresden Files. Oh, we oh, the Dresden Files. Okay, I was about to say. Yeah, we, what are we reviewing this week? We're in the, I, I just watched nine episodes of one show in one day, right. so my, my mind is a little bit clouded by yeah. that one. Cancel we're reviewing comes out in the middle of the week. Critically, comes out at the end of the we're week. We're reviewing The Dresden Files from the Sci-Fi Network, a, yeah. a supernatural investigator show about a wizard who solves wizard crimes. Yes, and then next week we're going to be reviewing Freaky Links, mm -hmm. the uh, X-Files knockoff about the internet and also produced from the guys who did uh, The Blair Witch Project. Mm. Which, Which they reference in the show. Of course they do. Yeah. It was a huge thing. I it, thought I'd make a movie like that witch movie. You see that witch movie? No. But you realize that because of the uh, Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, acknowledged that the Blair Witch Project was a real movie, that puts Freaky Links in canon. Oh, I suppose so. Uh, <laughs> makes you think. Um, so that's what's going on over there. That's a separate thing. You can subscribe to Cancel Too Soon uh, on iTunes or Stitcher mm. or wherever other uh, fine podcasts are given away for free. But we also have a Patreon page for that, patreon.com slash cancel too soon. If you want to join up, we got a bunch of bonus content as well. So thank you, everybody, for listening. We will see you next week. And uh, oh, we're on Twitter at mm. William DeVine. Uh, I'm Matt Whitney Seibold. And uh, never forget, everyone is a critic. I'm sorry, what? <laughs>